historic girls, stories of girls who have influenced the history of their times, by Elbridge Streeter Brooks. Preface In these progressive days, when so much energy and discussion are devoted to what is termed equality and the rights of women, it is well to remember that there have been in the distant past women and girls even who by their actions and endeavors proved themselves the equals of the men of their time in valor, shrewdness, and ability. This volume seeks to tell for the girls and boys of today the stories of some of their sisters of the long ago, girls who by eminent position or valiant deeds became historic even before they had passed the charming season of girlhood. Their stories are fruitful of varying lessons, for some of these historic girls were willful as well as courageous and mischievous as well as tender-hearted. But from all the lessons and from all the morals, one truth stands out most clearly. The fact that age and country, time and surroundings make but little change in the real girl nature that has ever been impulsive, trusting, tender, and true, alike in the days of the Syrian Zenobia and in those of the modern American schoolgirl. After all, Whatever the opportunity, whatever the limitation, whatever the possibilities of this same never-changing girl nature, no better precept can be laid down for our own bright young maidens, as none better can be deduced from the stories herewith presented than that phrase in Kingsley's noble yet simple verse. Be good, sweet maid, and let who will be clever, do noble things, not dream them all day long and so make life, death, and the vast forever one grand, sweet song. Grateful acknowledgment is made by the author for the numerous expressions of interest that came to him from his girl readers as the papers now gathered into book form appeared from time to time in the pages of St. Nicholas. The approval of those for whom one studies and labors is the pleasantest and most enduring return. End of Preface Section 1. Zenobia of Palmyra, the Girl of the Syrian Desert, afterward known as Zenobia Augusta, Queen of the East, A.D. 250. Many and many miles and many days' journey toward the rising sun, over seas and mountains and deserts, farther to the east than Rome, or Constantinople, or even Jerusalem and old Damascus, stand the ruins of a once mighty city scattered over a mountain-walled oasis of the great syrian desert thirteen hundred feet above the sea and just across the northern border of arabia look for it in your geographies it is known as palmyra today the jackal prowls through its deserted streets and the lizard suns himself on its fallen columns while thirty or forty miserable Arabian huts huddled together in a small corner of what was once the great courtyard of the magnificent Temple of the Sun. And yet, sixteen centuries ago, Palmyra, or Tadmor, as it was originally called, was one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Nature and art combined to make it glorious. Like a glittering mirage, out of the sand-swept desert arose its palaces and temples and grandly sculptured archways, with aqueducts and monuments and gleaming porticos, with countless groves of palm-trees and gardens full of verdure, with wells and fountains, market and circus, with broad streets stretching away to the city gates, and lined on either side with magnificent colonnades of rose-coloured marble, such was Palmyra in the year of our Lord 250, when, in the soft Syrian month of Nisan, or April, in an open portico in the great colonnade, and screened from the sun by gaily coloured awnings, two young people, a boy of sixteen and a girl of twelve, looked down upon the beautiful street of the thousand columns, as lined with bazaars and thronged with merchants it stretched from the wonderful temple of the sun, to the triple gateway of the sepulchre nearly a mile away. Both were handsome and healthy, true children of old Tadmor, that glittering fairy-like city which, Arabian legends say, was built by the genie 
for the great King Solomon ages and ages ago. Midway between the Mediterranean and the Ephurates, it was the meeting place for the caravans from the east and the wagon trains from the west, and it had thus become a city of merchant princes, a wealthy commercial republic, like Florence and Venice in the Middle Ages, the common toll gate for both the east and west. But, though a tributary colony of Rome, it was so remote a dependency of that mighty mistress of the world that the yoke of vassalage was but carelessly worn and lightly felt. The great merchants and chiefs of caravans who composed its senate and directed its affairs, and whose glittering statues lined the sculptured cornice of its marble colonnades, had more power and influence than the far-off emperor at Rome, and but small heed was paid to the slender garrison that acted as guard of honour to the strategy of special officers who held the colony for Rome and received its yearly tribute. And yet so strong a force was Rome in the world, that even this free-tempered desert city had gradually become Romanized in manners as in name, so that Tadmor had become first Adrianopolis and then Palmyra. And this influence had touched even these children in the portico, for their common ancestor, a wealthy merchant of a century before, had secured honour and rank from the Emperor Septimus Severus, the man who walled in England, and of whom it was said that he never performed an act of humanity or forgave a fault. Becoming, by the Emperor's grace, a Roman citizen, this merchant of Palmyra, according to a custom of the time, took the name of his royal patron as that of his own. Fad, or family, and the father of young Odhainat in the portico, as was Odhainat himself, was known as Septimus Odeenathus, while the young girl found her Arabic name Bath Sabai, Latinized into that of Septima Zenobia. But as, thinking nothing of all this, they looked lazily on the throng below, a sudden exclamation from the lad caused his companion to raise her flashing black eyes inquiringly to his face. What troubles you, my Odhainat? There, there, look there, Bath Sabai, replied the boy excitedly, coming through the Damascus arch, and we thought him to be in Emesa. The girl's glance followed his guiding finger, but even as she looked, a clear trumpet peal rose above the din of the city, while from beneath a sculptured archway that spanned a colonnaded cross street, the bright April sun gleamed down upon the standard of Rome with its eagle crest and its SPQR design beneath. There is a second trumpet peal, and swinging into the great street of the thousand columns, at the head of his light armed legionnaires, writes the centurion Rufinus, lately advanced to the rank of tribune of one of the chief Roman cohorts in Syria. His coming, as Odhainat and even the young Bath Sabai knew, meant a stricter supervision of the city, a reinforcement of its garrison, and the assertion of the mastership of Rome over this far eastern province on the Persian frontier. "'But why should the coming of the Romans so trouble you, my Odhainat?' she asked. We are neither Jew nor Christian that we should fear his wrath, but free Palmyrians who bend the knee neither to Roman nor Persian masters. Who will bend the knee no longer, be it never so little, my cousin, exclaimed the lad hotly, as this very day would have shown had not this crafty Rufinus, may great Solomon's genie dash him in the sea, come with his cohort to mar our meshes. Yet see, who cometh now? he cried, and at once the attention of the young people was turned in the opposite direction as they saw, streaming out of the great fortress-like courtyard of the Temple of the Sun, another hurrying throng. Then young Odhainat gave a cry of joy. "'See, Bath Sabai, they come, they come!' he cried. "'It is my father, Odhainat the Eskoros, with all the leaders and all the bowmen and spearmen of our father, armed and in readiness.' This day we will fling off the Roman yoke and become the true and unconquered lords of Palmyra, and I too must join them, he added. But the young girl detained him. Wait, cousin, she said. Watch and wait. Our fad will scarce attempt so brave a deed today with these new Roman soldiers in our gates. That were scarcely wise. But the boy broke out again. So they have seen each other, he said. Both sides are pressing on. 
True, and they will meet under this very portico, said Bath Sabai, and moved both by interest and desire, this dark-eyed Syrian girl, to whom fear was never known, standing by her cousin's side, looked down upon the tossing sea of spears and lances, and glittering shields and helmets that swayed and surged in the street below. So, dear Nathus, said Rufinus, the tribune, reining in his horse, and speaking in harsh and commanding tones. What meaneth this array of armed followers? Are the movements of Septimus Odernathus, the headman, of such importance to the noble tribune that he must need question a free merchant of Palmyra as to the number and manner of his servants? asked Odernathus haughtily. Dog of a Palmyrian, slave of a camel driver, said the Roman angrily, trifle not with me. Were you ten times the free merchant you claim, you should not thus reply. Free forsooth, none are free but Romans. Have a care, O Rufinus, said the Palmyrian boldly. Choose wiser words if you would have peaceful ways. Palmyra brooks no such slander of her foremost men. And Rome brooks no such men as you, traitor, said Rufinus. Ay, traitor, I say, he repeated, as Odeanathus started at the word. Think not to hide your plots to overthrow the Roman power in your city, and hand the rule to the base saper of Persia. Everything is known to our great father, the emperor, and thus doth he reckon with traitors. Macrinus, strike! And at his word, the short Gallic sword in the ready hand of the big German foot soldier went straight to its mark, and Odionathus, the head man of Palmyra, lay dead in the street of the thousand columns. So sudden and so unexpected was the blow, that the Palmyrians stood as if stunned, unable to comprehend what had happened. But the Roman was swift to act. "'Sound trumpets! Down pikes!' he cried, as the trumpet peal rose loud and clear. Fresh legionnaires came hurrying through the Damascus arch, and the Pilum and Spartha of Rome bore back the shields and lances of Palmyra. But before the lowered pikes could fully disperse the crowd, the throng parted, and through the swaying mob there burst a light and flying figure, a brown-skinned maid of twelve with streaming hair, loose robe, and angry flashing eyes. Right under the lowered pikes she darted, and, all flushed and panting, defiantly faced astonished roofness. Close behind her came an equally excited lad who, when he saw the stricken body of his father on the marble street, flung himself weeping upon it but Bath Sabai's eyes flashed still more angrily. "'Assassin! Murderer!' she cried. "'You have slain my kinsman and Odhainat's father. How dare you! How dare you!' she repeated vehemently, and then, flushing with deeper scorn, she added, "'Roman, I hate you! Would that I were a man! Then should all Palmyra know how—' "'Scorch these children home!' broke in the stern roofiness, "'or fetch them by the ears to their nurses and their toys.' Let the boys and girls of Palmyra beware how they mingle in the matters of their elders, or in the plots of their fathers. Men of Palmyra, you who today have dared to think of rebellion, look on your leader here and know how Rome deals with traitors. But, because of the merchant Odeanuthus bore a Roman name, and was of Roman rank, ho, soldiers, bear him to his house, and let Palmyra pay such honour as befits his name and station. The struggling children were half led, half carried into the sculptured atrium of the palace of Odeanathus, which, embowed in palms and vines and wonderful eastern plant, stood back from the marble colonnade on the street of the thousand columns. And when in that same atrium the body of the dead merchant lay embalmed and draped for its long home there, kneeling by the stricken form of the murdered father and kinsman, and with uplifted hand, after the vindictive manner of these fierce old days of blood, Odermathus and Zenobia swore eternal hatred to Rome. Hatred, boys and girls, is a very ugly as it is a very headstrong fault, but as there is a good side even to a bad habit, so there is a hatred which may rise to the height of a virtue. Hatred of vice is virtue, hatred of tyranny is patriotism. It is this which has led the world from slavery to freedom, from ignorance to enlightenment, and inspired the words that have found immortality alike above the ashes of Bradshaw 
the regicide, and of Jefferson the American. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. But how could a fatherless boy and girl, away off the edge of an Arabian desert, hope to resist successfully the mighty power of imperial Rome? The story of their lives will tell. If there are some people who are patriots, there are others who are poltroons, and such a one was Herion, the elder brother of young Othainat, when, succeeding to his dead father's wealth and power, he thought less of Roman tyranny than of Roman gold. "'Revenge ourselves on their purses, my brother, and not on their pikes,' he said. "'Tis easier and more profitable to sap the Roman's gold than to shed the Roman's blood.' But this submission to Rome only angered Odhainat, and to such a conflict of opinion did it lead that at least Hiron drove his younger brother from the home of his father, and the lad, an Esau, among the Jacobs of Tadmor, so the record tells us, spent his youth amid the rowing Bedaween of the Arabian deserts and the mountaineers of the Armenian hills, waiting his time. But, though a homeless exile, the dark-eyed Bath Sabai did not forget him. In the palace of another kinsman, Septimus Wurud, the lord of the markets, she gave herself up to carefully study and hoped for the day of Palmyra's freedom. As rich in powers of mind as in the graces of form and face, she soon became a wonderful scholar of those distant days, mistress of four languages, Coptic, Syriac, Latin, and Greek while the fairy temper of the girl grew into the nobler ambitions of the maiden. But above all things, as became her mingled Arabic and Egyptian blood, for she could trace her ancestry back to the free chiefs of the Arabian desert, and to the dauntless Cleopatra of Egypt, she loved the excitement of the chase, and in the plains and mountains beyond the city she learned to ride and hunt with all the skill and daring of a young Diana. And so it came to pass, that when the Emperor Valerian sent an embassy from Rome to Ctesiphon, bearing a message to the great king, as Saper, the Persian monarch, was called, the embassy halted in Palmyra, and Septimus Hiron, now the headman of the city, ordered, in the name of the senate and people of Palmyra, a grand venatio, or wild beast hunt, in the circus near the street of the Thousand Columns, in honour for his Roman guests and he dispatched his kinsman, Septimus Sabai, the soldier, to the Aremian hills to superintend the capture and delivery of the wild game needed for the hunt. With a great following of slaves and huntsmen, Sabai the soldier departed, and with him went his niece, Bath Sabai, or Zenobia, now a fearless young huntress of fifteen. Space will not permit to tell of the wonders and excitement of that wild beast hunt a hunt in which none must be killed but all must be captured without mar or wound. Such a trapping of wolves and bears and buffaloes was there, such a setting of nets and pitfall for the mountain lion and the Syrian leopard, while the Arab hunters beat and drove and shouted, or lay in wait with net and blunted lance, that it was rare sport to the fearless Zenobia, who rode her fleet Arabian horse at the very head of the chase. And, with quick eye and practised hand, helped largely to swell the trophies of the hunt. What girl of to-day, whom even the pretty little jumping mouse of Syria would scare out of her wits, could be tempted to witness such a scene? And yet this young Palmyrian girl loved nothing better than a chase, and the records tell us that she was a passionate hunter, and that she pursued with ardour the wild beasts of the desert, and thought nothing of fatigue or peril. So, through dense Armenian forests, and along rugged mountain paths, down rock-strewn hill-slopes, and in green low-lying valleys, the chase swept on, and one day, in one of the pleasant glades which, half sun and half shadow, stretch away to the Lebanon hills, young Bath Sabai suddenly reined in her horse, in full view of one of the typical hunting scenes of those old days. A young Arabian hunter had enticed a big mountain lion into one of the strong meshed nets of stout palm fibres, then used for such purposes. His trained leopard, or cheetah, had drawn the beast from his lair, 
and by cunning devices had led him on until the unfortunate lion was half entrapped. Just then, with a sudden swoop, a great golden eagle dashed down upon the preoccupied cheetah and buried his talons in the leopard's head. But the weight of his victim was more than he had bargained for. The cheetah, with a quick upward dash, dislodged one of the great bird's talons, and, turning as quickly, caught the disengaged leg in his sharp teeth. At that instant the lion, springing at the struggling pair, started the fastenings of the net, which, falling upon the group, held all three prisoners. The eagle and the lion thus ensnared sought to release themselves, but only ensnared themselves the more, while the cunning cheetah, versed in the knowledge of the hunter's net, crept out from beneath the meshes as his master raised them slightly, and with bleeding head crawled to him for praise and relief. Then the girl, flushed with delight at this double capture, galloped to the spot, and in that instant she recognized in the successful hunter her cousin the exile. "'Well snared, my Titan, she said, the first exclamation of surprise over. She stood beside the brown-faced and sturdy young hunter. "'The Palmyrian leopard hath bravely trapped both the Roman eagle and the Persian lion. See, is it not an omen from the gods?' Face valour with valour, and craft with craft, O Othainat! Have you forgotten the vow in your father's palace full three years ago? Forgotten it, not he, and then he told Bath Sabai how in all his wanderings he had kept their vow in mind, and with that, too, her other words of counsel. Watch and wait, he told her that, far and wide, he was known to all the Arabs of the desert and the Armenians of the hills and how, from sheikh to camel-boy, the tribes were ready to join with Palmyra against both Rome and Persia. "'Your time will indeed come, my Odhainat, said the fearless girl, with proud looks and ringing voice. "'See, even thus our omen gives the proof.' And she pointed to the net, beneath whose meshes both eagle and lion, fluttering and panting, lay wearing with their struggles while the cheetah kept watch above them. "'Now make your peace with Hiran, your brother.' Return to Palmyra once again, and still let us watch and wait. Three more years passed. Valerian, emperor of Rome, leading his legions to war with Saper, whom men called the Great King, had fallen a victim to the treachery and traps of the Persian monarch, and was held a miserable prisoner in the Persian capital, where, richly robed in the purple of the Roman emperors and loaded with chains, he was used by the savage Persian tyrant, as a living horse-block for the sport of an equally savage court. In Palmyra, Hayron was dead, and young Odhainat, his brother, was now Septimus Odeanathus, headman of the city, and to all appearances the firm friend of Rome. There were great rejoicings in Palmyra when wise Zenobia, still scarce more than a girl, and the fearless young headman of the desert republic were married in the marble city of the palm-trees, and her shrewd counsels brought still greater triumphs to Odenathus and to Palmyra. In the great market-place or forum, Odenathus and Zenobia awaited the return of their messengers to Saper, for the great king, having killed and stuffed the captive Roman emperor, now turned his arms against the Roman power in the east, and, destroying both Antioch and Emesa, looked with an evil eye toward Palmyra. Zenobia, Remembering the omen of the eagle and the lion, repeated her counsel of facing craft with craft, and letters and gifts had been sent to Saper, asking for peace and friendship. There is a hurried entrance through the eastern gate of the city, and the messengers from the Palmyrian senate rush into the market-place. "'Your presents to the great king have been thrown into the river, O Odenathus,' they reported, and thus saith Saper of Persia, who is this Odenathus, that he should thus presume to write to his lord? If he would obtain mitigation of the punishment that awaits him, let him fall prostrate before the foot of our throne, with his hands bound behind his back. Unless he doeth this, he, his family, and his country shall surely perish. Swift to wrath, and swifter still to act, Zenobia sprang to her feet. Face force with force, Odenathus. Be strong and sure, and Palmyra shall yet humble the Persian. Her advice was taken. Quickly collecting the troops of Palmyra, and the Arabs and Armenian, who were his allies, the fearless headman fell upon the army of the haughty Persian king, 
defeated and despoiled it, and drove it back to Persia. As Gibbon, the historian, says, The majesty of Rome, oppressed by a Persian, was protected by an Arab of Palmyra. For this he was covered with favours by Rome, made supreme commander in the east, and, with Zenobia as his adviser and helper, each year made Palmyra stronger and more powerful. Here, rightly, the story of the girl Zenobia ends. A woman now, her life fills one of the most brilliant pages of history. While her husband conquered for Rome in the north, she, in his absence, governed so wisely in the south as to ensure the praise of all. And when the time was ripe, and Rome, ruled by weak emperors and harassed by wild barbarians, was in dire stress, the childish wow of the boy and girl made years before found fulfilment. Palmyra was suddenly declared free from the dominion of Rome, and Odenathus was acknowledged by senate and people as emperor and king of kings. But the hand of an assassin struck down the son as it had stricken the father. Zenobia, ascending the throne of Palmyra, declared herself Zenobia Augusta, the empress of the east, and, after the manner of her time, extended her empire in every direction until, as record says, a small territory in the desert, under the government of a woman, extended its conquest over many rich countries and several states. Zenobia, lately confined to the barren plains about Palmyra, now held sway from Egypt in the south, to the Bosphorus and the Black Sea in the north. But a new emperor ruled in Rome, Aurelian, soldier and statesman, Rome, he said, shall never lose a province. And then the struggle for dominion in the east began. The strength and power of Rome, directed by the emperor himself, at last triumphed. Palmyra fell, and Zenobia, after the most heroic defence of her kingdom, was led a prisoner to Rome. Clad in magnificent robes, loaded with jewels and with heavy chains of gold, she walked, regal and undaunted still in the great triumphal procession of her conqueror and disdaining to kill herself as did cleopatra and dido she gave herself up to the noble work of the education and culture of her children and led for many years in her villa at tibur the life of a noble roman matron such in brief is the story of zenobia you must read for yourself the record of her later years as it stands in history, if you would know more of her grandeur in her days of power, and her moral grandeur in her days of her feet. And with Zenobia fell Palmyra. Centuries of ruin and neglect have passed over the once fairy-like city of the Syrian oasis. Her temples and colonnades, her monuments and archways and wonderful buildings, are prostrate and decayed, and the site even of the glorious city has been known to the modern world only within the last century. But while time lasts, and the record of heroic deeds survives, neither fallen column nor ruined arch, nor all the destruction and neglect of modern barbarism, can blot out the story of the life and worth of Bath Sabai, the brave girl of the Syrian desert, whom all the world honours as the noblest woman of antiquity, Zenobia of Palmyra, the dauntless queen of the East. End of section 1 Section 2 of Historic Girls Helena of Britain, The Girl of the Essex Fells, Part 1 Afterward known as St. Helena, the mother of Constantine, A.D. 255 Ever since that far-off day in the infancy of the world, when lads began to form and rivers to flow seaward, the little river Colne has wound its crooked way through the fertile fields of Essex eastward to the broad north sea. Through hillland and through moorland, past Moines and Great Yeldum, past Halstead and Chapel and the walls of Colchester, turning now this way and now that, until it comes to Mercy Island and the sea, the little river flows today even as it sped along one pleasant summer morning, sixteen hundred and forty years ago, when a little British princess, only fairly in her teens, reclined in comfortable contentment in her gilded barge and floated down the river from her father's palace at Colchester to the strand at Wivenlow. For this little girl of fourteen, Helena the princess, was a king's daughter, and, according to all accounts, a very bright and charming girl besides, which all princesses have not been. Her father was Cole, 
second prince of Britain and king of that part of ancient England, which includes the present shires of Essex and of Suffolk, about the river Colne. Not a very large kingdom, this, but even as small as it was, King Cole did not hold it in undisputed sway. For he was one of the tributary princes of Britain, in the days when Roman arms and Roman law and Roman dress and Roman manners had place and power throughout England, from the Isle of Wight to the northern highlands, behind whose forest-crowned hills those savage natives, known as the Picts, the tattooed folk, held possession of ancient Scotland, and defied the eagles of Rome. The monotonous song of the rowers, keeping time with each dip of the broad-bladed oars, rose and fell in answer to the beats of the master's silver baton, and Helena too followed the measure with a tap-tap of her sandaled foot. Suddenly there shot out around one of the frequent turns in the river the gleam of other oars, the high prow of a larger galley, and across the water came the oar song of a larger company of rowers. Helena started to her feet. "'Look, Leon,' she cried, pointing eagerly towards the approaching boat. "'Tis my father's own trireme. "'Why this haste to return, thinkst thou?' "'I cannot tell, little mistress,' replied the freedman Cleon, her galley-master. "'The king thy father must have urgent tidings to make him return thus quickly to Camalodunum. Both the girl and the galley-master spoke in Latin, for the language of the empire was the language of those in authority or in official life even in its remotest provinces, and the galley-master did but use the name which the Roman lords of Britain had given to the prosperous city on the Colm, in which the native prince, King Cole, had his court, the city which today is known under its later Saxon name of Colchester. It was indeed a curious state of affairs in England. I doubt if many of my girl and boy readers, no matter how well they may stand in their history classes, have ever thought of the England of Hereward and Ivanhoe, of Paul Domi and Tom Brown, as a Roman land. And yet, at the time when this little Flavia Julia Helena was sailing down the river Colne, the island of Britain, in its southern section at least, was almost as Roman in manner, custom, and speech as was Rome itself. For nearly five hundred years, from the days of Caesar the Conqueror to those of Honorius the Unfortunate, was England, or Britain as it was called, a Roman province, broken only in its allegiance by the early revolts of the conquered people, or by the later usurpations of ambitious and unprincipled governors. And, at the date of our story, in the year 255 AD, the beautiful island had so far grown out of the barbarisms of ancient Britain, as to have long since forgotten the gloomy rites and open-air altars of the Druids, and all the half-savage surroundings of those stern old priests. Everywhere Roman temples testified to the acceptance by the people of the gods of Rome, and little Helena herself, each morning, hung the altar of the emperor god Claudius with garlands, in the stately temple which had been built in his honour in her father's palace town, asked the protection of Cybele, the heavenly virgin, and performed the rites that the empire demanded for the thousand gods of Rome. Throughout the land, south of the massive wall, which the great Emperor Hadrian had stretched across the island from the mouth of the Solway to the mouth of the Tyne, the people themselves who had gathered into or about the thirty growing Roman cities which the conquerors had founded and beautified, had become Roman in language, religion, dress, and ways, while the educational influences of Rome, always following the course of her conquering eagles, had planted schools and colleges throughout the land and laid the foundation for that native learning which in later years was to make the English nation so great and powerful. And what a mighty empire must have been that of Rome, that, in those far-off days, when rapid transit was unknown, and steam and electricity both lay dormant, could have entered into the lives of two bright young maidens so many leagues removed from one another, Zenobia the dusky Palmyrian of the East, and Helena the fresh-faced English girl of the West. But to such distant and widely separated confines had this power of the vast empire extended, and to this thoughtful young princess, drifting down the winding English river, the sense of Roman supremacy and power would come again and again. For this charming young girl, 
said later to have been the most beautiful woman of her time in England. Though reared to Roman ways and Roman speech, had too well furnished a mind not to think for herself. She spake, so says the record, many tongues and was replete with piety. The only child of King Cole, her doting old father had given her the finest education that Rome could offer. She was, even before she grew to womanhood, so we are told, a fine musician, a marvellous worker in tapestry, in hammered brass and pottery, and was altogether as wise and wonderful a young woman as even these later centuries can show. But for all this grand education, she loved to hear the legends and stories of her people that in various ways would come to her ears, either as the simple tales of her British nurse or in the wild songs of the wandering bards or singers. As she listened to these, she thought less of those crude and barbaric ways of her ancestors that Rome had so vastly battered than of their national independence and freedom from the galling yoke of Rome. And, as was natural, she cherished the memory of Boadicea, the warrior queen, and made a hero of the fiery young Caractacus. It is always so, you know. Every bright young imagination is apt to find greater glories in the misty past or grander possibilities in a still more misty future than in the too practical and prosaic present in which both duty and destiny lie. And so Helena the princess, leaning against the soft cushions of her gilded barge, had sighed for the days of the old-time British valour and freedom, and, even as she looked off toward the approaching trireme, she was wondering how she could awake to thoughts of British glory, her rather heavy-witted father, Cole the king, an hereditary prince of that ancient Britain, in which he was now, alas, but a tributary prince of the all-too-powerful Rome. Now, old King Cole, as Mother Goose tells us, for young Helena's father was none other than the veritable old King Cole of our nursery jingle, was a jolly old soul, and a jolly old soul is very rarely an independent or ambitious one. So long as he could have his pipe and his bowl, not, of course, his long pipe of tobacco that all the Mother Goose artists insist upon giving him, but the reed pipe upon which his musicians played, so long, in other words, as he could live in ease and comfort, undisturbed in his enjoyment of the good things of life, by his Roman overlords, he cared for no change. Rome took the responsibility, and he took things easily. But this very day, while his daughter Helena was floating down the river to meet him on the strand at Wivenlow, he was returning from an unsuccessful boar hunt in the Essex woods, very much out of sorts, cross because he had not captured the big boar he had hoped to kill, cross because his favourite musicians had been confiscated by the Roman governor or proprietor at Londonium, as London was then called, and still more cross because he had that day received dispatches from Rome demanding a special and unexpected tax levy, or tribute, to meet the necessary expenses of the new emperor Diocletian. Something else had happened to increase his ill-temper. His jolly old soul, vexed by the numerous crosses of the day, was thrown into still greater perplexity by the arrival, just as he stood fretful and chafing on the shore at Wivenlow, of one who even now was with him on the trireme, bearing him company back to his palace at Camelodunum. Carocius the Admiral. This Carocius the Admiral was an especially vigorous, valorous, and fiery young fellow of twenty-one. He was cousin to the Princess Helena, and a prince of the blood royal of ancient Britain. Educated under the strict military system of Rome, he had risen to distinction in the naval force of the empire, and was now the commanding officer in the northern fleet that had its central station at Gesuriacum, now Boulogne on the northern coast of France. He had chased and scattered the German pirates who had so long ravaged the northern seas, had been named by the Emperor Admiral of the North, and was the especial pride, as he was the dashing young leader of the Roman sailors along the English Channel and the German shores. The light barge of the princess approached the heavier boat of the king her father. At her signal, the oarsmen drew up alongside, and, scarce waiting for either boat to more than slacken speed, the nimble-footed girl sprang lightly to the deck of her father's galley. Then bidding the obedient Cleon take her own barge back to the palace, 
she hurried at once and without question, like the petted only child she was, into the high-raised cabin at the stern, where beneath the Roman standards sat her father the king. Helena entered the apartment at a most exciting moment, for there, facing her portly old father, whose clouded face bespoke his troubled mind, stood her trimly built young cousin Carocius the Admiral, bronzed with his long exposure to the sea blasts, a handsome young Viking, and, in the eyes of the hero loving Helen, very much of a hero because of his acknowledged daring and his valorous deeds. Neither man seemed to have noticed the sudden entrance of the girl, so deep were they in talk. I tell thee, uncle, the hot headed admiral was saying, it is beyond longer bearing. This new emperor, this Diocletian, who is he to dare dictate to a prince of Britain, a foot soldier of Illyria, the son of slaves, and the client of three coward emperors, an assassin, so it hath been said, who from chief of the domestics hath become by his own cunning emperor of Rome. And now hath he dared to accuse me, me, a free Briton and a Roman citizen as well, a prince and the son of princes, with having taken bribes from these German pirates whom I have vanquished. He hath openly said that I, Carocius the Admiral, have filled mine own coffers while neglecting the revenues of the state. I will not bear it. I am a better king than he, did I but have my own just rights, and even though he be Diocletian the emperor, he needeth to think twice, before he dare accuse the prince of Britain with bribe-taking and perjury. True enough, good nephew, said King Cole, as the admiral strode up and down before him, angrily playing with the hilt of his short Roman sword. True enough, and I too have little cause to love this low-born emperor. He hath taken from me both my players and my gold, when I can illy spare either for my comfort or my necessities. Tis a sad pass for Britain, but Rome is mistress now. What may we hope to do? The princess Helena sprang to her father's side, her young face flushed, her small hand raised in emphasis. Do, cried she, and the look of defiance flamed on her fair young face. Do! Is it thou, my father, thou, my cousin, princes of Britain both, that ask so weak a question? Oh, that I were a man! What did that brave enemy of our house, Cavicillanus, do? What Caractacus? What the brave Queen Boadicea? When the Roman drove them to despair, they raised the standard of revolt, sounded their battle cries, and showed the Roman that British freemen could fight to the death for their country and their home. And thus should we do, without fear or question, and see here again in Britain a victorious kingdom ruled once more by British kings. Nay, nay, my daughter, said cautious King Cole, your words are those of an unthinking girl. The power of Rome. But the prince Carocius, as the girl's brave words rang out, gave her an admiring glance, and crossing to where she stood, laid his hand approvingly upon her shoulder. The girl is right, uncle, he said, breaking in upon the king's cautious speech. Too long have we bowed the neck to Roman tyranny. We, free princes of Britain that we are, have it even now in our power to stand once again as altogether free. The fleet is mine, the people are yours if you will but amuse them. Our brothers are groaning under the load of Roman tribute, and are ripe to strike. Raise the cry at Camelodunum, my uncle, cry, Havoc in death to Rome. My fleet shall pour its victorious sailors upon the coast. The legions, even now full of British fighters, shall flock out to united standards, and we shall rule emperors in the north, even as do the Roman conquerors rule emperors in the south. Young blood often sways and leads in counsel and in action, especially when older minds are overcautious or sluggish in decision. The words of Carocius and Helena carried the day with Cole the king, already smarting under a sense of ill-treatment by his Roman overlords. End of section two. Section three. Helena of Britain, the girl of the Essex Fells, part two. The standard of revolt was raised in Camelodunum. The young admiral hurried back to France to make ready his fleet, while Cole the king, spurred on to action by the patriotic Helena, who saw herself another Boadicea, though in truth a younger and much fairer one, gathered a hasty following, 
won over to his cause by the British Field Legion in his palace town, and, descending upon the nearest Roman camps and stations, surprised, captured, scattered, or brought over their soldiers, and proclaimed himself free from the yoke of Rome and supreme prince of Britain. Ambition is always selfish. Even when striving for the general good, there lies too often beneath this noble motive the still deeper one of selfishness. Carotius the admiral, though determined upon kingly power, had no desire for a divided supremacy. He was determined to be sole emperor, or none. Crafty and unscrupulous, although brave and high-spirited, he deemed it wisest to delay his part of the compact until he could see how it fared with his uncle, the king, and then, upon his defeat, to climb to certain victory. He therefore sent to his uncle promises instead of men, and when summoned by the Roman governor to assist in putting down the revolt, he returned loyal answers, but sent his aid to neither party. King Cole, after his first successes, knew that, unaided, he could not hope to withstand the Roman force that must finally be brought against him. Though urged to constant action by his wise young daughter, he preferred to do nothing, and satisfied with the acknowledgment of his power in and about his little kingdom on the Colne, he spent his time in his palace with the musicians that he loved so well, and the big bowl of liquor that he loved, it is to be feared, quite as dearly. The musicians, the pipers and the harpers, sang his praises, and told of his mighty deeds, and, no doubt, their refrain was very much the same as the one that has been preserved for us in the jingle of Mother Goose. O oh, none so rare as can compare with King Cole and his fiddlers three. But if the pleasure-loving old king was listless, young Helena was not. The misty records speak of her determined efforts, and though it is hard to understand how a girl of fifteen can do anything towards successful generalship, much can be granted to a young lady who, if the records speak truth, was, even while a girl, a Minerva in wisdom and not deficient in statecraft. So while she advised, with her father's boldest captains, and strengthened so wisely the walls of ancient Colchester, or Camalodunum, the traces of her work still remain as proof of her untiring seal. She still cherished the hope of British freedom and release from Rome. And the loving old king, deep in his pleasures, still recognized the will and wisdom of his valiant daughter, and bade his artists make in her honor a memorial that should ever speak of her valor. And this memorial, lately unearthed, and known as the Colchester Sphinx, perpetuates the lion-like qualities of a girl in her teens who dared withstand the power of imperial Rome. And still no help came from her cousin, the admiral. But one day, a galley speeding up the coal brought this unsigned message to King Cole. To Cole, Camelodunum, greeting. Save thyself. Constantius the sallow-faced, prefect of the western Praetorians, is even now on his way from Spain to crush thy revolt. Save thyself. I wait. Justice will come. Thou seest, O daughter, said King Cole, as Helena read the craven missive. The end cometh as I knew it would. Well, man can but die. And with this philosophic reflection, the jolly old soul only dipped his red nose still deeper into his big bowl, and bade his musicians play their loudest and merriest. But Helena, not deficient in statecraft, thought for both. She would save her father, her country, and herself, and shame her disloyal cousin. Discretion is the better part of valour. Let us see how discreet a little lady was this fair young Princess Helena. The legions came to Camalodunum. Across Gaul and over the choppy channel they came, borne by the very galleys that were to have succored the British king. Up through the mouth of Thames they sailed, and landing at Londinium, marched in close array along the broad Roman road that led straight up to the gates of Camalodunum. Before the walls of Camalodunum was pitched the Roman camp, and the British king was besieged in his own palace town. The Roman trumpet sounded before the gate of the beleaguered city, and the herald of the prefect, standing out from a circle of guards, cried the summons to surrender. Cole of Britain, traitor to the Roman people and to thy lord the emperor, hear thou. 
in the name of the senate and people of rome i constantius the prefect charge thee to deliver up to them ere this day's sun shall set this their city of camelodunum and thine own rebel body as well which done they will in mercy pardon the crime of treason to the city and will work their will and punishment only upon thee the chief rebel and if this be not done within the appointed time then will the walls of this their town of camelodunum be overthrown and thou and all thy people be given the certain death of traitors king cole heard the summons and some spark of that very patriotism that had inspired and incited his valiant little daughter flamed in his heart he would have returned an answer of defiance i can at least die with my people he said but young helena interposed leave this to me my father she said as i have been the cause so let me be the end of trouble say to the prefect that in three hours time the british envoy will come to this camp with the king's answer to his summons the old king would have replied otherwise but his daughter's entreaties and the counsels of his captains who knew the hopelessness of resistance forced him to assent and his herald made answer accordingly constantius the prefect a manly pleasant-looking young commander called chlorus or the sallow from his pale face sat in his tent within the roman camp the three hours grace allowed had scarcely expired when his sentry announced the arrival of the envoy of coal of britain bid him enter said the prefect then as the curtains of his tent were drawn aside the prefect started in surprise for there before him stood not the rugged form of a british fighting man but a fair young girl who bent her graceful head in reverent obeisance to the youthful representative of the imperial caesars what wouldst thou with me maiden asked the prefect i am the daughter of coal of britain said the girl and i am come to sue for pardon and for peace the roman people have no quarrel with the girls of britain said the prefect hath then king coal fallen so low in state that a maiden must plead for him he hath not fallen at all o prefect replied the girl proudly the king my father would withstand thy force but that i his daughter know the cause of this unequal strife and seek to make terms with the victors the girl's fearlessness pleased the prefect for constantius chlorus was a humane and gentle man fierce enough in fight but seeking never to needlessly wound an enemy or lose a friend and what are thy terms fair envoy of britain he demanded these o prefect replied helena if but thou wilt remove thy cohorts to londinium i pledged my father's faith and mine that he will within five days deliver to thee as hostage for his fealty myself and twenty children of his counsellors and captains and further i helena the princess will bind myself to deliver up to thee with the hostages the chief rebel in this revolt and the one to whose counselling the strife with rome is due both the matter and the manner of the offered terms still further pleased the prefect and he said be it so princess then summoning his lieutenant he said conduct the envoy of coal of britain with all courtesy to the gates of the city and with a herald's escort the girl returned to her father again the old king rebelled at the terms his daughter had made i know the ways of rome he said i know what their mercy meaneth thou shalt never go as hostage for my faith o daughter nor carry out this hazardous plan i have pledged my word and thine o king said helena surely a briton's pledge should be as binding as a roman's so she carried her point and in five days time she with twenty of the boys and girls of camelodunum went as hostages to the roman camp in london here be thy hostages fair princess said constantius the prefect as he received the children and this is well but remember the rest of thy compact deliver to me now according to thy promise the chief rebel against rome she is here o prefect said the intrepid girl i am that rebel helena of britain the smile upon the prefect's face changed to sudden sternness trifle not with roman justice girl he said i demand the keeping of thy word it is kept replied the princess helena of britain is the cause and motive of this revolt against rome if it be rebellion for a free prince to claim his own 
if it be rebellion for a prince to withstand for the sake of his people the unjust demands of the conqueror if it be rebellion for one who loveth her father to urge that father to valiant deeds in defence of the liberties of the land over which he ruleth as king then i am a rebel for i have done all these and only because of my words did the king my father take up arms against the might and power of rome i am the chief rebel do with me as thou wilt and now the prefect saw that the girl spoke the truth and that she had indeed kept her pledge thy father and his city are pardoned he announced after a few moments of deliberation remain thou here thou and thy companions as hostages for britain until such time as i shall determine upon the punishment due to one who is so fierce a rebel against the power of rome so the siege of camelodunum was raised and the bloodless rebellion ended constantius the prefect took up his residence for a while within king cole's city and at last returned to his command in gaul and spain well pleased with the spirit of the little maiden whom so he claimed he still held in his power as the prisoner of rome constantius the prefect came again to britain and with a greater following fully ten years after king cole's revolt for now again rebellion was afoot in the island province Carrochius the admiral biding his time sought at last to carry out his scheme of sole supremacy sailing with his entire war fleet to britain he won the legions to his side proclaimed himself emperor of britain and defied the power of rome so daring and successful was his move that rome for a time was powerless Carrochius was recognized as associate emperor by rome until such time as she should be ready to punish his rebellion and for seven years he reigned as emperor of britain but ere this came to pass helena the princess had gone over to gaul and had become the wife of constantius the prefect since only thus said he may i keep in safe custody this prisoner of rome the imperial power of carrochius was but short-lived crafty himself he fell a victim to the craft of others and the sword of Alectus, his chief minister and most trusted confidant, ended his life when once again the power of Rome seemed closing about the little kingdom of Britain. Constantius became governor of Britain, and finally Caesar and emperor. But long before that day arrived, the princess Helena had grown into a loyal Roman wife and mother, dearly loving her little son Constantine, who, in after years, became the first and greatest christian emperor of rome she bestowed much loving care upon her native province of britain she became a christian even before her renowned son had his historic vision of the flaming cross when more than eighty years old she made a pilgrimage to the holy land there she did many good and kindly deeds erected temples above the sepulchre of the saviour at his birthplace at bethlehem and on the mount of olives she is said also to have discovered upon calvary the cross upon which had suffered and died the saviour she had learned to worship beloved throughout her long and useful life she was canonized after her death and is now recognized one of the saints of the romish church to-day in the city of london you may see the memorial church reared to her memory the church of great saint helena in bishopgate a loving noble wonderful and zealous woman she is a type of the brave young girlhood of the long ago and however much of fiction there may be mingled with the fact of her life story she was we may feel assured all that the chroniclers have claimed for her one of the grandest women of the earlier centuries end of section three section four pulcheria of constantinople the girl of the golden horn afterward known as Pulcheria Augusta, Empress of the East, A.D. 413. There was trouble and confusion in the imperial palace of Theodosius, the little emperor of the East. Now, this Theodosius was called the little emperor because, though he bore the name of his mighty grandfather, Theodosius the Great, emperor of both the East and West, he has had yet done nothing worthy any other title than that of the little or the child for theodosius emperor though he was called was only a boy of twelve and not a very bright boy at that 
his father Arcadius the emperor, and his mother Eudoxia the empress, were dead. And in the great palace of Constantinople, in this year of grace, 413, Theodosius, the boy emperor, and his three sisters Pulcheria, Marina, and Arcadia, uphold the tottering dignity and the empty name of the once mighty empire of the East, which their great ancestors, Constantine and Theodosius, had established and strengthened. And now there was confusion in the imperial palace, for word came in haste from the Dancian border that Ruas, king of the Huns, sweeping down from the east, was ravaging the lands along the upper Danube, and with his host of barbarous warriors, was defeating the legions and devastating the lands of the empire. The wise Anthemius, perfect of the east, and governor or guardian of the young emperor, was greatly disturbed by the tidings of this new invasion. Already he had repelled at great cost the first advance of these terrible Huns, and had quelled into a sort of half-submission the less ferocious followers of Olpin the Thracian. But now he knew that his armies along the Danube were in no condition to withstand the hordes of Huns that, pouring in from distant Siberia, were following the lead of Ruas, their king, for plunder and booty, and were even now encamped scarce two hundred and fifty miles from the seven gates and the triple walls of splendid Constantinople. Turban Turks, mosques and minarets, muftis and Cadis, veiled eastern ladies, Mohammedans and Muzans, Arabian knights and attar of roses, bazaars, dogs, and donkeys, these, I suppose, are what Constantinople suggests whenever its name is mentioned to any girl or boy of today, the capital of modern Turkey, the city of the sublime port. But the greatest glory of Constantinople was away back in the early days before the time of Mohammed or of the Crusaders, when it was the center of the Christian religion, the chief and gorgeous capital of a Christian empire, and the residence of Christian emperors, from the days of Constantine the Conqueror to those to the Justinian, the lawgiver of the Irene the Empress. It was the metropolis of the eastern half of the great Roman Empire, and during this period of over five hundred years, all the wealth and treasure of the East poured into Constantinople, while all the glories of the empire, even the treasures of old Rome itself, were drawn upon to adorn and beautify this rival city by the golden horn. And so in the days of Theodosius the Little, the court of Constantinople, although troubled with fear of a barbarian invasion and attack, glittered with all the gorgeousness and display of the most magnificent empire in the world. In the great Daphne, or central space of the imperial palace, the perfect Anthemius, with the young emperor, the three princesses, and their gorgeously arrayed nobles and attendants, awaited one day the envoys of Ruas the Hun, who sought lands and power within the limits of the empire. They came at last, great, fierce-looking fellows, not at all pleasant to contemplate, big-boned, broad-shouldered, flat-nosed, swarthy, and small-eyed, with cloaks of shaggy skins, leathern armor, wolf-crowned helmets, and barbaric decorations, and the royal children shrunk from them in terror, even as they watched them with wondering curiosity. Imperial guards, gleaming in the golden armor, accompanied them, while the envoys came also as escort a small retinue of Hunnish spearmen. And in the company of these, the Princess Pulcheria noted a lad of ten or twelve years, short, swarthy, big-headed and flat-nosed like his brother barbarians, but with an air of open and hostile superiority that would not be moved even by all the glow and glitter of an imperial court. Then Eslaw, the chief of the envoys of King Ruas the Hun, made known his master's demand, so much land, so much treasure, so much in the way of concession and power over the lands along the Danube, or Ruas the king would sweep down with his warriors and lay waste the cities and lands of the empire. These be bold words, said Anthemius the perfect. And what if our lord the emperor shall say thee nay? But ere the chief of the envoys could reply, the lad whose presence in the escort 
of the Princess Pulcheria had noted, sprang into the circle before the throne, brandishing his long spear in hot defiance. Dogs, and children of dogs, ye dare not say us nay, he cried harshly, except we be made the friends and allies of the emperor, and are given full store of southern gold and treasure. Ruas the king, overturn these your palaces, and make you all captives and slaves. It shall be war between you and us for ever. Thus saith my spear. And as he spoke, he dashed his long spear upon the floor until the mosaic pavement rang again. Boy emperor and princesses, perfect and noble and imperial guards, sprang to their feet as the spear clashed on the pavement. And even the barbarian envoys, while they smiled grimly at their young comrade's energy, pulled him hastily back. But Hare, the perfect Anthemius, could sufficiently master his astonishment to reply. The young princess Pulcheria faced his savage envoys, and pointing to the cause of the disturbance, asked calmly, Who is this brawling boy, and what doth he hear in the palace of the emperor? And the boy made instant and defiant answer, I am Attila, the son of Munzuk, kinsman to Ruas the king, and deadly foe to Rome. Good Anthemius, said the clear, calm voice of the unterrified girl, were it not wise to tell this wild young prince from the northern forest that the great emperor hath gold for his friends, but only iron for his foes? "'Tis ever better to be friend than foe. "'Bid, I pray, that the arras of the Hippodrome be parted, "'and let our guests see the might and power of our arms.'" With a look of pleased surprise at this bold stroke of the princess, the perfect clapped his hands in command, and the heavily brocaded curtain that screened the gilded columns parted as if by unseen hands, and the Hunnish envoys, with a gaze of stolid wonder, looked down upon the great hippodrome of Constantinople. It was a vast enclosure, spacious enough for the marshalling of an army. Around its side ran tiers of marble seats, and all about it rose gleaming statues of marble, of bronze, of silver, and of gold. Augustus and the emperors, gods and goddesses of the old pagan days, heroes of the eastern and western empires, the bright oriental sun streamed down upon it, and as the trumpet sounded from beneath the imperial balcony, there filled into the arena the glittering troops of the empire, gorgeous in color and appointments, with lofty crests and gleaming armor, with shimmering spear tips, prancing horses, towering elephants, and mighty engines of war and siege, with archers and spearmen, with sounding trumpets and swaying standards, and high over all, the purple laborum, woven in gold and jewels, the sacred banner of Constantine, marching and countermarching around and around and in and out, until it seemed well nigh endless, the martial procession passed before the eyes of the northern barbarians, watchful of every moment, eager as children to witness this royal review. These are but as a handful of dust aim at the sands of the sea to the troops of the empire, said the perfect Anthemius, when the glittering rear guard had passed from the Hippodrome, and the princess Pulcheria added, And these, O men from the north, are to help and succor the friends of the great emperor, even as they are for the terror and destruction of his foes. Bid the messenger from Ruas the king consider, good Anthemius, whether it were not wiser for their master to be friend rather than the foe of the emperor. Ask him whether it would not be in keeping with his valor and his might to be made of the great captains of the empire with a yearly stipend of many pounds of gold as the recompense of the empire for his services and his love. Again, the perfect looked with pleasure and surprise upon this wise young girl of fifteen who had seen so shrewdly and so well the way to the hearts of these northern barbarians, to whom gold and warlike display were as meat and drink. You hear the words of this wise young maid, he said. Would it not please Ruas the king to be the friend of the emperor, a general of the empire, 
and the acceptor on each reoccurring season of the circensian games a full two hundred pounds of gold as recompense for services and friendship say rather three hundred pounds said isla the chief of the envoys and our master may perchance esteem it wise and fair nay it is not for the great emperor to chaffer with his friends said pulcheria the princess bid that the stipend be fixed at three hundred and fifty pounds of gold good anthemius and let our guests bear to ruas the king pledges and tokens of the emperor's friendship and bid to that they do leave yon barbarian boy at our court as hostage of their faith demanded young theodosius the emperor now speaking for the first time and making a most stupid blunder at a critical moment for with a sudden start of revengeful indignation young attila the hun turned to the boy emperor i will be no man's hostage he cried freely i came freely i will go come down from thy bauble of a chair and thou and i will try even in your circus yonder which is the better boy and which should rightly be hostage for faith and promise given how now exclaimed the boy emperor altogether unused to such uncourtier like language this to me and the hasty young hun continued i this and more i tell thee boy that i were ruas the king the grass should never grow where the hooves on the warlike horse trod scythia should be mine persia should be mine rome should be mine and look you sir emperor the time shall surely come when the king of the huns shall be content not with paltry tribute and needless office but with naught but roman treasure and roman slaves but into this torrent of words came pulcheria's calm voice again nay good attila and nay my brother and my lord she said twere not between friends and allies to talk of tribute nor of slaves nor yet of hostage freely didst thou come and as freely shalt thou go and let this pledge tell of friendship between theodosius the emperor and ruas the king and with a step forward she flung her own broad chain of gold around the stout and swarthy neck of the defiant young attila so through a girl's ready tact and quiet speech was the terror of barbarian invasion averted ruas the hun rested content for years with his annual salary of three hundred and fifty pounds of gold or over seventy thousand dollars and his title of general of the empire while not for twenty years did the hot-headed young attila make good on his threat against the roman empire anthemius the perfect like the wise man he was recognized the worth of the young princess pulcheria he saw how great was her influence over her brother the emperor and noted with astonishment and pleasure her words of wisdom and her rare common sense rule thou in my place o princess he said soon after this interview with the barbarian envoys thou alone of all in this broad empire art best fitted to take lead and direction in the duties of its governing pulcheria though a wise young girl was prudent and conscientious such high authority is not for a girl like me good anthemius she replied rather let me shape the ways and the growth of the emperor my brother and teach him how best to maintain himself and a deportment befitting his high estate so that he may be a wise and just ruler but be thou bare sway for him until such time as he may take the guidance on himself nay not so princess the old perfect said she who can shape the ways of a boy may guide the will of an empire be thou then regent and augusta and rule this empire as becometh the daughter of arcadius and the granddaughter of the great theodosius and as he desired so it was decided the senate of the east decreed it and in long procession over flower-strewn pavements and through gorgeously decorated streets with the trumpets sounding their loudest with swaying standards and rank upon rank of imperial troops with great officers of the government and throngs of palace attendants 
this young girl of sixteen, on the fourth day of July, in the year 414, proceeded to the church of the Holy Apostles, and was there publicly proclaimed Pulcheria Augusta, Regent of the East, solemnly accepting the trust as a sacred and patriotic duty. And now, many days after, before the high altar of this same church of the Holy Apostles, Pulcheria the Princess stood with her younger sisters Arcadia and Marina, and with all the impressive ceremonial of the Eastern Church, made a solemn vow to devote their lives to the keeping of their father's heritage and the assistance of their only brother, to forswear the world and all its allurements, never to marry, and to be in all things faithful and constant to each other in this their promise and their pledge. And they were faithful and constant. The story of those three determined young maidens, yet scarcely in their teens, reads almost like a page from Tennyson's beautiful poem, The Princess, with which many of my girl readers are doubtless familiar. The young regent and her sisters, with their train of attendant maidens, renounced the vanity of dress. Wearing only plain and simple robes, they spent their time in making garments for the poor and embroidered work for church decorations, and with song and prayer and frugal meals, interspersed with frequent fasts, they kept their vow to forswear the world, its allurements, in an altogether strict and monotonous manner. Of course, this style of living is no more to be recommended to healthy, hardy, fun-loving girls of fifteen than is its extreme of gaiety and indulgence. But it had its effect, and in those bad old days of dissipation and excess, and the simplicity and soberness of this wise young girl's life, in the very midst of so much power and luxury, made even the worst elements in the empire respect and honor her. It would be interesting, did space permit, to sketch at length some of the devisings and doings of this girl regent at sixteen. She superintended with extraordinary wisdom, says the old chronicler Sozman, the transactions of the Roman government, and afforded the spectacle, says Ozenam, a later historian, of a girlish princess of sixteen, granddaughter and sole inheritor of the genius and the courage of Theodosius the Great governing the empires of the east and west and being proclaimed on the death of her brother augusta imperiatrix and mistress of the world this last event the death of theodosius the younger occurred in the year 449 and pulcheria ascended the golden throne of constantinople the first woman that ever ruled as sole empress of the roman world she died july 18 453 that same year saw the death of her youthful acquaintance, Attila the Hun, that fierce barbarian whom men had called the Scourge of Gold. His mighty empire stretched from the Great Wall of China to the Western Alps. But though he ravaged the lands of both Eastern and Western Rome, he seems to have been so managed or controlled by the wise and peaceful measures of the girl regent that his destroying hordes never troubled the splendid city of the golden horn which offered so rare and tempting a booty it is not given to the girls of today to have anything like the magnificent opportunities of the young pulcheria but duty in many a form faces them again and again while not unfrequently the occasion comes from sacrifice of comfort or for devotion to a trust to all such the example of this fair young princess of old constantinople who, fifteen centuries ago, saw her duty plainly, and undertook it simply and without hesitation, comes to strengthen and incite, and the girl who feels herself overwhelmed by responsibility, or who is fearful of her own untried powers, may gather strength, courage, wisdom, and will from the story of this historic girl of the long ago, the wise young regent of the East, Pulcheria, of Constantinople. End of section four. Section five of Historic Girls. Clotilda of Burgundy, the girl of the French vineyards, afterwards known as Saint Clotilda, 
the first queen of france a d four eighty five it was little more than fourteen hundred years ago in the year of our lord four eighty five that a little girl crouched trembling and terrified at the feet of a pitying priest in the palace of the kings of burgundy there has been many a sad little maid of ten before and since the days of the fair-haired princess clotilda but surely none had greater cause for terror in tears than she for her cruel uncle gundibald waging war against his brother kilperic the rightful king of burgundy and with a band of savage followers burst into his brother's palace and after the fierce and relentless fashion of those cruel days had murdered king kilperic the father of little clotilda the queen her mother and the little princess her brothers and was now searching for her and her sister sedelinda to kill them also poor sedelinda had hidden away in some other far-off corner but even as clotilda hung for protection to the robe of the good stranger priest ugo of reims whom the king her father had lodged in the palace on his homeward journey from jerusalem the clash of steel drew nearer and nearer through the corridor came the rush of feet the arras in the doorway was rudely flung aside and the poor child's fierce pursuers with her cruel uncle at their head rushed into the room hallo here hides the game he cried in savage exultation thrust her away sir priest or thou diest in her stead not one of the tyrant's brood shall live i say it and who art thou to judge of life or death demanded the priest sternly as he still shielded the trembling child i am gundibald king of burgundy by the grace of mine own good sword and the right of succession was the reply trifle not with me sir priest but thrust away the child she is my lawful prize to do with as i will ho siegbert drag her forth quick as a flash the brave priest stepped before the cowering child and with one hand resting protectingly on the girl's fair hair he raised the other in stern and fearless protest and boldly faced the murderous throng back mid of blood he cried back nor dare to lay a hand on this young maid who hath here sought sanctuary footnote under the goths and franks the protection of churches and priests when extended to persons in peril was called the right of sanctuary and was respected even by the fiercest of pursuers End footnote. fierce and savage men always respect bravery in others there was something so courageous and heroic in the act of that single priest in thus facing a ferocious and determined band in defense of a little girl for girls were but slightingly regarded in those far-off days that it caught the savage fancy of the cruel king and this joined with his respect for the church's right of sanctuary and with the lessening of his thirst for blood now that he had satisfied his first desire for revenge led him to desist so be it then he said lowering his threatening sword i yield her to thee sir priest look to her welfare in thine own surely a girl can do no harm but king gundibald and his house lived to learn how far wrong was that unguarded statement for the very lowering of his murderous sword that thus brought life to little princess clotilda meant the downfall of the kingdom of burgundy and the rise of the great victorious nation of france the memories of even a little maid of tin are not easily blotted out her sister sedelinda had found refuge and safety in the covenant of a nay near at hand and there too clotilda would have gone but her uncle the new king said no the maidens must be forever separated he expressed a willingness however to have the princess clotilda brought up in his palace which had been her father's and requested the priest ugo of reims to remain a while and look after the little girl's education in those days a king's request was a command and the good ugo though stern and brave in the face of real danger was shrewd enough to know that it was best for him to yield to the king's wishes so he continued in the palace of the king looking after the welfare of his little charge until suddenly the girl took matters into her own hands and decided his future and her own the kingdom of burgundy in the days of princess clotilda was a large tract of country now embraced by southern france and western switzerland it had been given over by the romans to the goths who had invaded it in the year four thirteen it was a land of forest and vineyards of fair valleys and sheltered hillsides 
and of busy cities that the fostering hand of Rome had beautified, while through its broad domain the Rhone, pure and sparkling, swept with a rapid current from Swiss lake and glacier southward to the broad and beautiful Mediterranean. Lyons was its capital, and on the hill of fervor, overlooking the city below it, rose the marble palace of the Burgundian kings, near to the spot where today the ruined forum of the old Roman days is still shown to tourists. It had been a palace for centuries. Roman governors of imperial Gaul had made it their headquarters and their home. Three Roman emperors had cooed and cried as babies within its walls, and it had witnessed also many a feast and foray, and the changing fortunes of Roman, Gaelic, and Burgundian conquerors and overlords. But it was no longer home to the little princess Clotilda. She thought of her father and mother, and of her brothers, the little princes with whom she had played in this very palace, as it now seemed to her so many years ago. And the more she feared her cruel uncle, the more did she desire to go far, far away from his presence. So, after thinking the whole matter over, as little girls of tin can sometimes think, she told her good friend Hugo, the prince, of her father's youngest brother, Gorogisel, who ruled the dependent principality of Geneva, far up the valley of the Rhone. Yes, child, I know the place, said Hugo. A fair city indeed, on the blue and beautiful Lake Limanus, walled in by mountains, and rich in corn and vineyards. Then let us fly thither, said the girl. My uncle Gorogisel, I know, will succor us and I shall be freed from my fears of King Gundibald. Though it seemed at first to the good priest only a child's desire, he learned to think better of it when he saw how unhappy the poor girl was in the hated palace, and how slight were her chances for improvement. And so, one fair spring morning in the year 486, the two slipped quietly out of the palace, and by slow and cautious stages, with help from friendly priests and nuns, and frequent rides in the heavy ox wagons, that were the only means of transport other than horseback, they finally reached the old city of Geneva. By telling his bright young charge of all the wonders and relics he had seen in his journeyings in the east, but especially did the girl love to hear him tell of the boy king of the Franks, Clodowig, or Clovis, who lived in the priest's own boyhood home of Tournay, in far-off Belgium, and who, though so brave and daring, was still a pagan when all the world was fast becoming Christian. And as Clotilda listened, she wished that she could turn this brave young chief away from his heathen deities, Thor and Odin, to worship of the Christian's god. And revolving strange fancies in her mind, she determined what she would do when she grew up, as many a girl since her day has determined. But even as they reached the fair city of Geneva, then half Roman, half Gaelic in its buildings and its life. The wonderful news met then how this boy King Clovis, sending a challenge to combat to the perfect Syagrius, the last of the Roman governors, had defeated him in battle at Soissons and broken forever the power of Rome in Gaul. War, which is never anything but terrible, was doubly so in those savage days, and the plunder of the captured cities and homesteads was the chief return for the barbarian soldiers follow their leaders. But when the Princess Clotilda heard how, even in the midst of his burning and plunder, the young Frankish chief spared some of the fairest Christian churches, he became still more her hero, and again the desire to convert him from paganism and to revenge her father's murder took shape in her mind. For, devout though she was, this excellent little maiden of the year 485 was by no means the gentle-hearted girl of 1888, and like most of the world about her, had but two desires, to become a good church helper and to be revenged on her enemies. Certainly, fourteen centuries of progress and education have made us more loving and less vindictive. But now that the good priest Hugo of Reims saw that his own homeland was in trouble, he felt that there lay his duty, and Gorogisel, the under-king of Geneva, feeling uneasy alike from the nearness of this boy conqueror and the possible displeasure of his brother and overlord, King Gundibald, 
declined longer to shelter his niece in his palace at Geneva. And why may I not go with you? the girl asked of Ugo. But the old priest knew that a conquered and plundered land was no place to which to convey a young maid for safety, and the princess therefore found refuge among the sisters of the church of St. Peter in Geneva, and here she passed her girlhood, as the record says, in works of piety and charity. So four years went by. In the north, the boy chieftain reaching manhood had raised aloft on the shields of his fair-haired and long-limbed followers, and with many a hail and shout had been proclaimed king of the Franks. In the south, the young princess Clotilda, now nearly sixteen, had washed the feet of pilgrims, ministered to the poor, and afterward the manner of her day had proved herself a zealous church worker in that low-roofed covenant near the old church of St. Peter, high on the same hill in Geneva, where today, hemmed in by narrow streets and tall houses, the cathedral of St. Peter twice rebuilded since Clotilda's time, overlooks the quaint city, the beautiful lake of Geneva, and the rushing Rhone, and sees across the valley of the Arve the gray and barren rocks of the Petite Salive and the distant snows of Mont Blanc. One bright summer day, as the young prince has passed into the hospitium, or guest room for poor pilgrims, attached to the convent, she saw there a stranger dressed in rags. He had the wallet and staff of a mendicant, or begging pilgrim, and coming toward her he asked for charity in the name of the blessed St. Peter, whose church thou servest. The young girl brought the pilgrim food, and then according to the custom of the day, kneeling on the earthen floor, she began to bathe his feet. But as she did so, the pilgrim, bending forward, said in a low voice, Lady, I have great matters to announce to thee, if thou deign to permit me to reveal them. Pilgrims in those days were frequently made the bearers of special messages between distant friends, but this poor young orphan princess could think of no one from whom a message to her might come. Nevertheless, she simply said, Say on. In the same low tone the beggar continued, Clovis, king of the Franks, sends thee greeting. This beggar must be a madman, she thought. But the eyes of the pilgrim looked at her reassuringly, and he said, In token whereof he sendeth thee this ring by me, his confidant, and comitatus. Footnote. One of the king's special bodyguard, from which comes the title Comp, Count. In footnote. Aurelian of Soissons. The princess Clotilda took, as if in a dream, the ring of transparent jacinth, set in solid gold, and asked quietly, What would the king of Franks with me? The king, my master, hath heard from the holy bishop Rimi, and the good priest Ugo of thy beauty and discreetness, replied Aurelian, and likewise of the sad condition of one who is the daughter of a royal line. He bade me use all my wit to come nigh to thee, and to say that if it be the will of the gods, he would fain raise thee to his rank by marriage. Those were the days of swift and sudden surprises, when kings made up their minds in royal haste, and princesses were not expected to be surprised at whatever they might hear. And so we must not feel surprised to learn that all the dreams of her younger days came into the girl's mind, and that... As the record states, she accepted the ring with great joy. Return promptly to thy lord, she said to the messenger, and bid him, if he would fain unite me to him in marriage, to send messengers without delay to demand me of my uncle King Gundibald, and let those same messengers take me away in haste, so soon as they shall have obtained permission. For this wise young princess knew that her uncle's word was not to be long depended upon, and she feared, too, that certain advisers at her uncle's court might counsel him to do her harm before the messengers of King Clovis could have conducted her beyond the borders of Burgundy. Aurelian, still in his pilgrim's disguise, for he feared discovery in a hostile country, hastened back to King Clovis, who, the record says, was pleased with his success and with Cotilda's notion, and at once sent a deputation to Gundibald, to demand his niece in marriage. As Clotilda foresaw, 
her uncle stood in too much dread of this fierce young conqueror of the north to say him nay and soon the palace at lyons so full of terrible memories to this orphan girl the courteous aurelian now no longer in beggar's rags but gorgeous in white silk and a flowing sagum or mantle of vermilion publicly engaged himself as the representative of king clovis to the princess clotilda and according to the curious custom of the time cemented the engagement by giving the young girl a sou and a denier footnote two pieces of old french coin equaling about a cent and a meal in american money End footnote. now deliver the princess into our hand o king said the messenger that we may take her to king clovis who waiteth for us even now at challens to conclude these nuptials so almost before he knew what he was doing king gundebald had bidden his niece farewell and the princess with her escort of frankish spears was rumbling away in a clumsy bastern or covered ox wagon toward the frontier of burgundy but the slow-moving ox van by no means suited the impatience of this shrewd young princess she knew her uncle the king of burgundy too well when once he was roused to action he was fierce and furious good aurelian she said at length to the king's ambassador who rode by her side if that thou wouldst take me into the presence of thy lord the king of the franks let me descend from this carriage mount me on horseback and let us speed hence as fast as we may for never in this carriage shall i reach the presence of my lord the king and none too soon was her advice acted upon for the counsellors of king gundebald noticing clotilda's anxiety to be gone concluded that after all they had made a mistake in betrothing her to king clovis thou shouldst have remembered my lord they said that thou didst slay clotilda's father her mother and the young princes her brothers if clotilda becomes powerful be sure she will avenge the wrong that thou hast wrought her and forthwith the king sent off an armed band with orders to bring back both the princess and the treasure he had sent with her as her marriage portion but already the princess and her escort were safely across the Seine, where in the campania or plain country later known as the province of champagne she met the king of the franks i'm sorry to be obliged to confess that the first recorded desire of this beautiful brave and devout young maiden when she found herself safely among the fierce followers of king clovis was a request for vengeance but we must remember girls and boys that this is a story of half savage days when as i have already said the desire for revenge on one's enemies was common to all from the midst of his skin-clad and green-robed guards and nobles young clovis in a dress of crimson and gold and milk-white silk and with his yellow hair coiled in a great topknot on his uncovered head advanced to meet his bride my lord king said clotilda the bands of the king of burgundy follow hard upon us to bear me off command i pray thee that these my escort scatter themselves right and left for two score miles and plunder and burn the lands to the king of burgundy probably in no other way could this wise young girl of seventeen have so thoroughly pleased the fierce and warlike young king he gladly ordered her wishes to be carried out and the plunderers forthwith departed to carry out the royal command so her troubles were ended and this prince and princess hlodowig or clovis meaning the warrior youth and hlodohild or clotilda meaning the brilliant and noble maid in spite of the wicked uncle gundibald were married at soissons in the year 493 and as the fairy stories say lived happily ever after the record of their later years has no place in this sketch of the girlhood of clotilda but it is one of the most interesting and dramatic of the old-time historic stories the dream that sad little princess in the old convent of geneva to make her boy hero a christian and to be revenged on the murder of her parents was in time fulfilled for on christmas day in the year four ninety three 
the young king and three thousand of his followers were baptized amid gorgeous ceremonial in the great church of St. Martin at Reims. The story of the young queen's revenge is not to be told in these pages, but, though terrible, it is only one among the many tales of vengeance that show us what fierce and cruel folk our ancestors were. In the days when passion instead of love ruled the hearts of men and women, and of boys and girls as well, and how favored are we of this nineteenth century in all the peace and prosperity and home happiness that surround us. But from this conversion, as also from this revenge, came the great power of Clovis and Clotilda, for ere his death, in the year 511, he brought all the land under his sway from the Rhine to the Rhone, the ocean, and the Pyrenees. He was hailed by his people with the old Roman titles of Consul and Augustus, and reigned victorious as the King of France. Clotilda, after years of wise counsel and charitable works, upon which her determination for revenge seems to be the only stain, died long after her husband in the year 545. And today, in the city of Paris, which was even then the capital of New France, the church of St. Clotilda stands as her memorial, while her marble statue may be seen by the traveler in the great palace of the Luxembourg. A typical girl of those harsh old days of the long ago, loving and generous toward her friends, unforgiving and revengeful to her enemies, reared in the midst of cruelty and of charity, she did her duty according to the light given her, made France a Christian nation, and so helped on the progress of civilization. Certainly, a place among the world's historic girls may rightly be accorded to this fair-haired young princess of the summer land of France, the beautiful Clotilda of Burgundy. End of section 5 Section 6 of Historic Girls Wu of Huang Ho, the girl of the Yellow River, afterwards the great empress Wu of China, A.D. 635. Thomas the historian had been in many lands and in the midst of many dangers, but he had never before found himself in quite so unpleasant a position as now. Six ugly Tartar horsemen with very uncomfortable-looking spears and appalling shouts, and mounted on their swift Kurtz ponies, were charging down upon him, while neither the rushing yellow river on the right nor the steep dirt cliffs on the left could offer him shelter or means of escape. These dirt cliffs, or loess, to give them their scientific name, are remarkable banks of brownish-yellow loam, found largely in northern and western China, and rising sometimes to a height of a thousand feet. Their peculiar yellow tinge makes everything look huang, or yellow, and hence yellow is a favorite color among the Chinese. So, for instance, the emperor is Huang Ti, the lord of the yellow land. The imperial throne is the Huang Hui, or yellow throne of China. The great river, formerly spelled in your school geographies, Huang Ho, is Huang Ho, the yellow river, etc. These Huang cliffs, or dirt cliffs, are full of caves and crevices. But the good priest could see no convenient cave, and he had therefore no alternative but to boldly face his fate, and like a brave man calmly meet what he could not avoid. But, just as he had singled out, as his probable captor, one peculiarly unattractive-looking horseman, whose crimson sheepskin coat and long horsetail plume were streaming in the wind, and just as he had braced himself to meet the onset against the great Lois, or dirt cliff, he felt a twitch at his black upper robe, and a low voice, a girl's, he was confident, said quickly, Look not before nor behind thee, good Olopum, but trust to my word and give a backward leap. Thomas, the Nestorian, had learned two valuable lessons in his much wandering about the earth, never to appear surprised, and always to be ready to act quickly. So knowing nothing of the possible results of his action, but feeling that it could scarcely be worse than the death from Tartar spears, he leaped back as bidden. The next instant, 
he found himself flat upon his back in one of the low ceiling cliff caves that abound in western china while the screen of vines that had concealed its entrance still quivered from his fall picking himself up and breathing a prayer of thanks for his deliverance he peered through the leafy doorway and behold in surprise six much astonished tartar robbers regarding with looks of puzzled wonder a defiant little chinese girl who had evidently darted out of the cave as he had tumbled in she was facing the enemy as boldly as he had and her little almond eyes fairly danced with mischievous delight at their perplexity at once he recognized the child she was who the high-spirited or dauntless one the bright young girl whom he had often noticed in the throng at his mission house in Tung Cho, the little city by the Yellow River where her father, the bannerman, held guard at the Dragon Gate. He was about to call out to the girl to save herself, when with a sudden swoop the Tartar, who had braced himself to resist, bent in his saddle and made a dash for the child, but agile little Wu was quicker than the Tartar horseman. With a nimble turn and a sudden spring, she dodged the tartar's hand, darted under his pony's legs, and with a shrill laugh of derision, sprang up the sharp incline and disappeared in one of the many cliff caves before the now doubly baffled horseman could see what had become of her. With a grunt of discomfiture and disgust, the tartar riders turned their ponies' heads and galloped off along the road that skirted the yellow waters of the swift-flowing Huang Ho. Then a little yellow face peeped out of the cave further up the cliff. A black-haired, tightly braided head bobbed and twitched with delight, and the next moment the good priest was heartily thanking his small ally for so skillfully saving him from threatened capture. It was a cool September morning in the days of the great Emperor Tai, 1250 years ago, and the great emperor was Tai Sung, though few, if any, of my young readers ever heard his name. His splendid palace stood in the midst of lovely gardens in the great city of Chang'an, that old, old city that for over two thousand years was the capital of China, and which you can now find in your geographies under its modern name, Singan Fu. And in the year 635, when our story opens, the name Tai Sung was great and powerful throughout the length and breadth of Cheng Kuo, the Middle Kingdom, as the Chinese for nearly thirty centuries have called their vast country. While the stories of his fame and power had reached the western courts of India and of Persia, of Constantinople, and even of distant Rome, it was a time of darkness and strife in Europe, already what historians have called the Dark Ages had settled upon the Christian world and among all the races of men the only nation that was civilized and learned and cultivated and refined in this seventeenth century of christian era was this far eastern empire of china where schools and learning flourished and arts and manufacturers abound when america was as yet undiscovered and europe was sunk in degradation and here since the year 505 the nestorians a branch of the Christian church, originating in Asia Minor in the 5th century and often called the Protestants of the East, had been spreading the story of the life and love of Christ. And here, in this year of grace 635, in the city of Chang'an, and in all the region about the Yellow River, the good priest Thomas the Nestorian, whom the Chinese called Olopun, the nearest approach they could give to his strange Assyriac name had his Christian mission house and was zealously bringing to the knowledge of a great and enlightened people the still greater and more helpful light of Christianity. My daughter, said the Nestorian after his words of thanks were uttered, this is a gracious deed done to me and one that I may not easily repay, yet would I gladly do so if I might. Tell me, what wouldst thou like above all other things? The answer of the girl was as ready as it was unexpected. To be a boy, O oh master, she replied. Let the great Sang Ti, footnote, Almighty Being, in footnote, 
who might thou teachest make me a man that i may have revenge the good priest had found strange things in his mission in this far eastern land but this wonderful demand of an excited little maid was full as strange as any for china is ever and has been a land in which the chief things taught to the children are subordination passive submission to the law to parents and to all superiors and a peaceful demeanor revenge is not for men to trifle with nor maids to talk of he said harbor no such desires but rather come with me and i will show thee more attractive things this very day doth the great emperor go forth from the china of peace footnote the meaning of sheng and the ancient capital of china is the city of continuous peace in footnote to the banks of the yellow river come thou with me to witness the splendor of his train and perchance even to see the great emperor himself and the young prince kao his son that i will not then cried the girl more hotly than before i hate this great emperor as men do wrongfully call him and i hate the young prince kao may lung huang the god of the dragons dash them both beneath the yellow river ere yet they leave its banks this day at this terrible wish on the lips of a girl the good master very nearly forgot even his most valuable precept never to be surprised he regarded his defiant young companion in sheer amazement have a care have a care my daughter he said at length the blessed saint james telleth us that the tongue is a little member but it can kindle a great fire how mayst thou hope to say such direful words against the son of heaven footnote the son of heaven is one of the chief titles of the chinese emperor End footnote. and live the son of heaven killed the emperor my father said the child the emperor thy father thomas the nestorian almost gasped in this latest surprise is the girl crazed or does she sport with one who seeketh her good and amazement and perplexity settled upon his face the princess Wu is neither crazed nor doth she sport with the master said the girl i do but seeketh the truth great is tai sung whom he will he slayeth and whom he will he keepeth alive and then she told the astonished priest that the bannerman at the dragon gate was not her father at all for she said as she had lain awake only the night before she had heard enough in talk between the bannerman and his wife to learn her secret how that she was the only daughter of the rightful emperor the prince kang ti whose guardian and chief adviser the present emperor had been how this trusted protector had made away with poor kung ti in order that he might usurp the throne and how she the princess wu had been flung into the swift wang ho from the turbid waters of which she had been rescued by the bannermen of the dragon gate this may or may not be so thomas the nestorian said uncertain whether or not to credit the girl's surprising story but even were it true my daughter how couldst thou right thyself what can a girl hope to do the young princess drew up her small form proudly do she cried in brave tones i can doeth much wise olopun girl though i am did not a girl save the divine books of confucius when the great emperor chi huang ti did command the burning of all the books in the empire did not a girl though but a Su slayer's daughter raised the outlaw lu peng straight to the yellow throne and shall i who am the daughter of emperors fail to be as able or as brave as they the wise nestorian was shrewd enough to see that here was a prize that might be worth the fostering by the assumption of mystic knowledge he learned from the bannerman of the dragon gate the truth of the girl's story and so worked upon the good bannerman's native superstition and awe of superior power as to secure the custody of the young princess and to place her in his mission house of tung chow 
for teaching and guidance. Among the early Christians, the Nestorians held peculiarly helpful and elevating ideas of the worth and proper condition of woman. Their precepts were full of mutual help, courtesy, and fraternal love. All these the princess Wu learned under her preceptor's guidance. She grew to be even more assertive and self-reliant, and became also expert in many sports, in which, in that woman-despising country, only boys could hope to excel. One day, when she was about fourteen years old, the Princess Wu was missing from the Nestorian mission house by the Yellow River. Her troubled guardian, in much anxiety, set out to find the truant, and finally, in the course of his search, climbed the high bluff from which he saw the massive walls, the many gateways, the gleaming roofs and porcelain towers of the imperial city of Cheng An Di, city of continuous peace. But even before he had entered its northern gate, a little maid in loose silken robe, peaked cap, and embroidered shoes had passed through that very gateway, and slipping through the thronging streets of the great city, approached at last the group of picturesque and glittering buildings that composed the palace of the great Emperor Tai. Just within the main gateway of the palace rose the walls of the Imperial Academy, where 8,000 Chinese boys received instruction under the patronage of the Emperor, while just beyond extended long, low range of the archery school, in which even the Emperor himself sometimes came to witness or take part in the exciting contests. Drawing about her shoulders the yellow sash that denoted alliance with royalty, the Princess Wu, without a moment's hesitation, walked straight through the palace gateway, past the wandering guards, and into the boundaries of the archery court. Here, the young Prince Kao, an indolent and lazy lad about her own age, was cruelly goading on his trained crickets to a ferocious fight within their gilded bamboo cage, while... Just at hand, the slaves were preparing his bow and arrows for his daily archery practice. Now, among the rulers of China, there are three classes of privileged targets. The skin of the bear, for the emperor himself. The skin of the deer, for the princes of the blood. And the skin of the tiger, for the nobles of the court. And thus, side by side in the imperial archery, school at Chang'an hung the three targets. The girl with the royal sash and the determined face walked straight up to the Prince Kao. The boy left off goading his fighting crickets and looked in astonishment at the strange and highly audacious girl who dared to enter a place from which all women were excluded. Before the guards could interfere, she spoke. Are the arrows of the great Prince Kao so well fitted to the cord, she said, that he dares to try his skill with one who, although a girl, hath yet the wit and right to test his skill? The guards laid hands upon the intruder to drag her away, but the prince nettled at her tone, yet glad to welcome anything that promised novelty or amusement, bade them hold off their hands. No girl speaketh thus, to the prince cow and liveth, he said insolently. Give me instant test of thy boast, or the wooden collar. Footnote. The wooden collar was the kia, or kang hu, a terrible instrument of torture used in China for the punishment of criminals. End footnote. In the palace torture house shall be thy fate. Give me the arrows, prince, the girl said bravely, and I will make good my words. At a sign, the slaves handed her a bow and arrows, but as she tried the cord and glanced along the polished shaft, the prince said, Yet, stay, girl, here is no target set for thee. Let the slaves set up the people's target. These are not for such as thou. Nay, prince, fret not thyself, the girl coolly replied. My target is here. And while all looked on in wonder, the undaunted girl deliberately towed the practice line, twanged her bow, and with a sudden whiz, sent her well-aimed shaft quivering straight into the small white center of the great bearskin 
the imperial target itself. With a cry of horror and rage at such sacrilege, the guards pounced upon the girl archer and would have dragged her away, but with the same quick motion that had saved her from the Tartar robbers, she sprang from their grasp, and standing full before the royal target, she said commandingly, Hands off, slaves, nor dare to question my right to the bearskin target. I am the Empress. It needed but this to cap the climax. Prince, guards, and slaves looked at this extraordinary girl in open-mouthed wonder, but ere their speechless amazement could change to instant seizure, a loud laugh rang from the imperial doorway, and a hearty voice exclaimed, Braved, and by a girl! Who is thy empress, prince? Let me too salute the Sai Ting. Footnote. The Sovereign Divine, an imperial title. End footnote. Then a portly figure, clad in yellow robes, strode down to the targets, while all within the archery lists prostrated themselves in homage before one of China's greatest monarchs, the Emperor Taisung Wun Wu Ti. Footnote. Our exalted ancestor, the literary martial emperor. End footnote. But before even the emperor could reach the girl, the bamboo screen was swept hurriedly aside, and into the archery list came the anxious priest, Thomas the Nestorian. He had traced his missing charge even to the imperial palace, and now found her in the very presence of those he deemed her mortal enemies. Prostrate at the emperor's feet, he told the young girl's story, and then pleaded for her life promising to keep her safe and secluded in his mission home at Tung Chao. The Emperor Tai laughed a mighty laugh, for the bold front of his only daughter of his former master and rival suited his warlike humor. But he was a wise and clement monarch withal. Nay, wise Olopun, he said, such rivals to our throne may not be at large, even those sheltered in the temples of the Hung Mao. Footnote. The light-haired ones, an old Chinese term for the Western Christians. End footnote. The royal blood of the House of Sui. Footnote. The name of the former dynasty. End footnote. Flows safely only within palace walls. Let the proper decree be registered, and let the gifts be exchanged, for tomorrow thy ward, the Princess Wu, becometh one of our most noble queens. And so at fourteen, even as the records show, this strong-willed young girl of the Yellow River became one of the wives of the great Emperor Tai. She proved a very gracious and acceptable stepmother to young Prince Kao, who, as the records also tell us, grew so fond of the girl queen that, within a year from the death of his great father, and when he himself had succeeded to the Yellow Throne, as Emperor Supreme, he recalled the Queen Wu from her retirement in the mission house at Tung Chao and made her one of his royal wives. Five years after, in the year 655, she was declared Empress, and during the reign of her lazy and indolent husband, she was the power behind the throne. And when, in the year 683, Kao Sung died, she boldly assumed the direction of the government and, ascending the throne, declared herself Wu Hao, Sai Tin Hu, the Empress Supreme and Sovereign Divine. History records that this Zenobia of China proved equal to the great task. She governed the empire with discretion, extended its borders, and was acknowledged as empress from the shores of the Pacific to the borders of Persia, of India, and of the Caspian Sea. Her reign was one of the longest and most successful in that period known in history as the Golden Age of China. Because of the relentless native prejudice against a successful woman in a country where girl babies are ruthlessly drowned as the quickest way of ridding the world of useless encumbrances, Chinese historians have endeavored to blacken her character and undervalue her services. But later, scholars now see that she was a powerful and successful queen who did great good to her native land 
and strove to maintain its power and glory. She never forgot her good friend and protector Thomas the Nestorian. During her long reign of almost fifty years, Christianity strengthened in the kingdom and obtained a footing that only the great Mahometan conquests of five centuries later entirely destroyed. And the Empress Wu, so the chronicles declare, herself offered sacrifices to the great god of all. When hundreds of years after, the Jesuit missionaries penetrated into the most exclusive of all the nations of the earth, they found near the palace at Chang'an the ruins of the Nestorian Mission Church, with the cross still standing, and preserved through all the changes of dynasties, an abstract in Syriac characters of the Christian law, and with it the names of seventy-two attendant priests who had served the church established by Olopun. Thus, in a land in which, from the earliest ages, women have been regarded as little else but slaves, did a self-possessed and wise young girl triumph over all difficulties and rule over her many millions of subjects in a matter becoming a great prince. This even her enemies admit. Lessening the miseries of her subjects, so the historians declare, she governed the wide empire of China wisely, discreetly, and peacefully, and she displayed upon the throne all the daring wit and wisdom that had marked her actions when years before she was nothing but a sprightly and determined little Chinese maiden on the banks of the turbid Yellow River. End of section six. Section seven of Historic Girls. Edith of Scotland, the girl of the Northern Abbey, afterward known as the Good Queen Maud of England, A.D. 1093. On a broad and deep window seat in the old Abbey guest house at Gloucester sat two young girls of thirteen and ten. Before them, brave looking enough in his old time costume, stood a manly young fellow of sixteen. The three were in earnest conversation all unmindful of the noise about them, the romp and riot of a throng of young folk, attendants or followers of the knights and barons of King William's court. For William Rufus, son of the conqueror and second Norman king of England, held his Whitsuntide Gimot, or summer council of his lords and lieges, in the curious old Roman Saxon Norman town of Gloucester, in the fair vale through which flows the noble Severn. The city is known to the young folk of today as the one in which good Robert Rakes started the first Sunday school more than a hundred years ago. But the gemo of King William the Red, which was a far different gathering from good Mr. Rakes' Sunday school, was held in the great chapter house of the old Benedictine Abbey, while the court was lodged in the Abbey guest houses, in the grim and fortress-like Gloucester Castle, and in the houses of the quaint old town itself. The boy was shaking his head rather doubtfully as he stood, looking down upon the two girls on the broad window seat. Nay, nay, Borsire. Footnote. Fair sir. An ancient style of address used especially toward those in high rank in Norman times. End footnote. Shake not your head like that, exclaimed the younger of the girls. We did escape that day, trust me, we did. Edith here can tell you I do speak the truth. For sure, twas her device. Thirteen-year-old Edith laughed merrily enough at her sister's perplexity, and said gaily, as the land turned questioningly to her, Sure then, boar sire, it's plain to see that you are southern-born, and know not the complexion of a Scottish mist. Yet tis even as Mary said, for, as we have told you, the maiden's castle standeth high-placed on the crag of Edwin's bog, and hath many and devious pathways to the lower gate, so when the Red Donald's men were swarming up the step, my uncle, the atheling, did guide us, by ways we knew well, and by twists and turnings that none knew better, straight through Red Donald's array, and all unseen and unnoted of them, because of the blessed thickness of the gathering mist. "'And this was your device?' asked the boy admiringly. "'Aye, but any one might have devised it too.' replied young Edith, modestly. Sure, 
"'Twas no great device to use a Scotch mist for our safety, "'and twa wiser to chance it than stay and be stupidly murdered by Red Donald's men. "'And so it was, good Robert, even as Mary did say, "'that we came forth unharmed from amidst them and fled here to King William's court, "'where we at last are safe.' "'Safe, say you? Safe?' exclaimed the lad impulsively. "'Aye, as safe as in a mouse nests in a cat's ear, "'as safe as is a rabbit in a ferret's hutch. "'But that I know you to be a brave and dauntless maid, "'I should say to you.' "'But ere Edith could know what he would say, "'their conference was rudely broken in upon. "'For a royal page, dashing up to the three, "'with scant courtesy seized the arm of the elder girl, "'and said hurriedly, "'Hasty, hasty, your lady! "'Our lord's king is even now calling for you to come before him in the banquet hall!' "'Edith knew too well the rough manners of those dangerous days. "'She freed herself from the grasp of the page and said, "'Nay, that may I not, Master Page. "'Tis neither safe nor seemly for a maid to show herself "'in a baron's hall or in a king's banquet room.' "'Safe and seemly it may not be, but come you must,' said the page rudely. "'The king demands it, and your nay is not.' and so hurried along whether she would or no, while her friend, Robert Fitz Godwine, accompanied her as far as he dared. The young Princess Edith was speedily brought into the presence of the King of England, William H., called from the colour of his hair and from his fairy temper, Rufus or the Red. For Edith and Mary were both princesses of Scotland, with a history, even before they had reached their teens, as romantic as it was exciting. Their mother, an exiled Saxon princess, had, after the conquest of Saxon England by the stern Duke William the Norman, found refuge in Scotland, and had there married King Malcolm Canmore, the son of that King Duncan whom Macbeth had slain. But when King Malcolm had fallen beneath the walls of Alnwick Castle, a victim to English treachery, and when his fierce brother Donald Bain, or Donald Red, had usurped the throne of Scotland, then the good Queen Margaret died in the grey castle on the rock of Edinburgh, and the five orphan children were only saved from the vengeance of their bad Uncle Donald by the shrewd and daring device of the young Princess Edith, who bade their good Uncle Edgar, the atheling, guide them, under the cover of the mist, straight through the Red Donald's knights and spearmen to England and safety. You would naturally suppose that the worst possible place for the fugitives to seek safety was in Norman England, for Edgar de Atheling, a Saxon prince, had twice been declared king of England by the Saxon enemies of the Norman conquerors, and the children of King Malcolm and Queen Margaret, half Scotch, half Saxon, were, by blood and birth, of the two races most hateful to the conquerors. But the Red King, in his rough sort of way, hot to-day and cold to-morrow, had shown something almost like friendship for this Saxon Atheling, a royal prince, who might have been king of England had he not wisely submitted to the greater power of Duke William the Conqueror, and to the Red William, his son. More than this, it had been rumoured that some two years before, when there was a truth between the kings of England and of Scotland, this harsh and headstrong English king, who was as rough and repelling as a chestnut burr, had seen, noticed, and expressed a particular interest in the eleven-year-old Scottish girl, this very Princess Edith, who now sought his protection. So, when this wandering uncle boldly threw himself upon Norman courtesy, and came with his homeless nephews and nieces straight to the Norman court for safety, King William Rufus not only received these children of his hereditary foreman with favour and royal welcome, but gave them comfortable lodgment in quaint old Gloucester town, where he held his court. But even when the royal fugitives deemed themselves safest, were they in greatest danger. Among the attendant knights and nobles of King William's court was a Saxon knight known as Sir Odgar, a thane or baronet of Oxfordshire, and because those who changed their opinions, political or otherwise, often proved the most unrelenting enemies of their former associates, it came to pass that Sir Odgar, the Saxon, conceived a strong dislike for these orphan descendants of the Saxon kings, and convinced himself that the best way to secure himself in the good graces of the Norman King William was to slander and accuse the children of the Saxon Queen Margaret. And so that very day in the great hall, when wine was flowing and passions were strong, 
this false knight, raising his glass, bade them all drink. Confusion to the enemies of our liege, the king, from the base Philip of France to the baser Edgar the Atheling and his Scottish brat. This was an insult that even the heavy and peace-loving nature of Edgar the Atheling could not brook. He sprang to his feet and denounced the charge. None here is truer or more leal to you, Lord King, he said, than I am, Edgar the Atheling, and my charges your guests. But King William Rufus was of that changing temper that goes with jealousy and suspicion. His flushed face grew still more red, and, turning away from the Saxon prince, he demanded, "'Why make you this charge, Sir Ordgar?' "'Because it is truth, your sire,' said the faithless knight. "'For what other cause hath this false atheling sought sanctuary here, save to use his own descent from the ancient kings of this realm to make head and force among your lieges? And his eldest king's girl here, the Princess Edith, has she not been spreading a trumpery story about the young folk of how some old verd vif? Footnote, which wife or seeress? End footnote, had said that she who is the daughter of kings shall be the wife and mother of kings. And is it not further true that when her aunt, the abbess of Ramsay, bade her wear the holy veil, she hath again and yet again torn it off, and affirmed that she, who was to be a queen, could never be made a nun, children and fools, to said, do speak the truth, Borsire, and in all this do I see the malice and device of this false atheling, the friend of your rebellious brother, Duke Robert, as you do know him to be, and I do brand him here, in this presence, as traitor and recreant to you, his lord. The anger of the jealous king grew more unreasoning as Sir Odger went on, Enough, he cried, seize the traitor. Or stay, children and fools, as you have said, Sir Odgar, do indeed speak the truth. Have in the girl, then let us hear the truth. Not seemly, Sir Atheling. He broke out in reply to some protest of Edith's uncle. What is seemly that the king doth wish? Holla, Raoul, Damien, Sir Pages, run one of you and seek the princess Edith and bring her here forthwith. And while Edgar the Atheling, realising that this was the gravest of all his dangers, strove, though without effect, to reason with the angry king, Damien the page, as we have seen, hurried after the princess Edith. How now, mistress? broke out the red king, as the young girl was ushered into the banquet hall, where the disordered tables, strewn with fragments of the feast, showed the ungentle manners of those brutal days. How now, mistress, do you prate of kings and queens and of your own designs, you who are but a beggar guest? Is it seemly or wise to talk? Nay, keep you quiet, Sir Atheling. We will have naught from you. To talk of thrones and crowns as if you did even now hope to win the realm from me. From me, your only protector. The Princess Edith was a very high-spirited maiden, as all the stories of her girlhood show and this unexpected accusation, instead of frightening her, only served to embolden her. She looked the angry monarch full in the face. "'Tis a false and lying charge, Lord King,' she said, "'from whomsoever it may come. Nought have I said but praise of you and your courtesy to us motherless folk. "'Tis a false and lying charge, and I am ready to stand test of its proving, come what may.' "'Even to the judgment of God, girl?' demanded the king and the brave girl made instant reply. Even to the judgment of God, Lord King. Then, skilled in all the curious customs of those warlike times, she drew off her glove. Whosoever my accuser be, Lord King, she said, I do denounce him as forsworn and false, and thus do I throw myself upon God's good mercy, if it shall please him to raise me up a champion. And she flung her glove upon the floor of the hall, in face of the king and all his barons. It was a bold thing for a girl to do, and a murmur of applause ran through even that unfriendly throng, for, to stand a test of a wager of battle, or the judgment of God, as the savage contest was called, was the last resort of any one accused of treason or of crime. It means no less than a duel to the death 
between the accuser and the accused or their accepted champions, and, upon the result of the duel, hung the lives of those in dispute. And the Princess Edith's glove, lying on the floor of the abbey hall, was her assertion that she had spoken the truth, and was willing to risk her life in proof of her innocence. Edgar the Atheling, peace-lover though he was, would gladly have accepted the post of champion for his niece, but, as one also involved in the charge of treason, such action was denied him. For the moment the Red King's former admiration for this brave young princess caused him to waver, but those were days when suspicion and jealousy rose above all nobler traits. His face grew stern again. "'Ordgar of Oxford,' he said, "'take up the glove.' and Edith knew who was her accuser. Then the king asked, "'Who standeth as champion for Edgar the Atheling in this maid, his niece?' Almost before the words were spoken, young Robert Fitz Godwine had sprung to Edith's side. "'That would I, Lord King, if a young squire might appear against the belted knight.' "'Ordgar of Oxford fights not with boys,' said the accuser contemptuously. The king's savage humour broke out again. "'Face him with your own page, Sir Ordgar,' he said with a grim laugh. "'Boy against boy would be a fitting wager for a young maid's life.' But the Saxon knight was in no mood for sport. "'Nay, boss, sire, this is no child's play,' he said. "'I care not for this girl. I stand as champion for the king against yon traitor Atheling, and if the maiden's cause is his, why then against her too?' This is a man's quarrel. Young Robert would have spoken yet again, as his face flushed hot with anger at the knight's contemptuous words. But a firm hand was laid upon his shoulder, and a strong voice said, Then it is mine, Sir Ordgar. If between man and man, then will I, with the gracious permission of our lord the king, stand as champion for this maiden here, and for my good lord, the noble Atheling, whose liegeman and whose man I am, next to you, lord king and taking the mate to the glove which the princess Edith had flung down in defiance, he thrust it into the guard of his cap, line, or iron skull cap, in token that he, Godwine of Winchester, the father of their boy Robert, was the young girl's champion. Three days after, in the tilt-yard of Gloucester Castle, the wager of battle was fought. It was no gay tournament show with streaming banners, gorgeous lists, gaily dressed ladies, flower-bedecked balconies, and all the splendid display of attorney of the knights, of which you read in the stories of romance and chivalry. It was a solemn and sombre gathering in which all the arrangements suggested only death and gloom, while the accused waited in suspense, knowing that halter and faggot were prepared for them, should their champion fall. In quaint and crabbed Latin, the old chronicler, John of Ferdin, tells the story of the fight, for which there is neither need nor space here. The glove of each contestant was flung into the lists by the judge, and the dispute committed for settlement to the power of God and their own good swords. It is a stirring picture of those days of daring and of might, when force took the place of justice, and the deadliest blows were the only convincing arguments. But, though supported by the favour of the king in the display of splendid armour, Ordgus treachery had its just reward. Virtue triumphed and vice was punished, even while treacherously endeavouring, after being once disarmed, to stab the brave Godwine with a knife which he had concealed in his boot. The false Sir Ordgar was overcome, confessed the falsehood of his charge against Edgar the Atheling, and Edith his niece, and, as the quaint old record has it, the strength of his grief and the multitude of his wounds drove out his impious soul. So young Edith was saved and, as is usually the case with men of his character, the Red King's humour changed completely. The victorious Godwine received the arms and lands of the dead Ordgar. Edgar the Atheling was raised high in trust and honour. The throne of Scotland, wrested from the Red Donald, was placed once more in the family of King Malcolm, and King William Rufus himself became the guardian and protector of the Princess Edith. And when, one fatal August day, the Red King was found pierced by an arrow under the trees of the New Forest. His younger brother, Duke Henry, whom men called Buclerc, the good scholar, for his love of learning and of books, 
ascended the throne of England as King Henry I, and the very year of his ascension, on the 11th of November, 1100, he married in the Abbey of Westminster, the Princess Edith of Scotland, then a fair young lady of scarce twenty-one. At the request of her husband she took, upon her coronation day, the Norman name of Matilda, or Maud, and by this name she is known in history and among the queens of England. So scarce four and thirty years after the Norman conquest, a Saxon princess sat upon the throne of Norman England, the loving wife of the son of the very man by whom Saxon England was conquered. Never, since the Battle of Hastings, says Sir Francis Palgrave, the historian, had there been such a joyous day as when Queen Maud was crowned. Victors and vanquished, Normans and Saxons, were united at last, and the name of good Queen Maud was long an honoured memory among the people of England. And she was a good queen. In the time of bitter tyranny, when the common people were but the serfs and slaves of the haughty and cruel barons, this young queen laboured to bring in kindliest manners and more gentle ways. Beautiful in face, she was still more lovely in heart and life. Her influence upon her husband, Henry the Scholar, was seen in the wise laws he made, and the charter of King Henry is said to have been gained by her intercession. This important paper was the first step toward popular liberty. It led the way to Magna Carta, and finally to our own declaration of independence. The boys and girls of America, therefore, in common with those of England, can look back with interest and affection upon the romantic story of good Queen Maud, the brave-hearted girl who showed herself wise and fearless both in the perilous mist at Edinburgh, and, later still, in the yet greater dangers of the black lists of Gloucester. End of section 7 Section 8 of Historic Girls Jacqueline of Holland, The Girl of the Land of Fogs, A.D. 1414 Count William of Hainault, of Zealand and Friesland, Duke of Bavaria and Sovereign Lord of Holland, held his court in the great straggling castle which he called his hunting lodge, near to the German Ocean and since known by the name of the Hague. The footnote reads, The Hague is a contraction of the Duchess Gravenhage, the hawk or hunting lodge of the Graf, or Count. Count William was a gallant and courtly knight, learned in all the ways of chivalry, the model of the younger cavaliers, handsome in person, noble in bearing, the surest lance in the tilting yard, and the stoutest arm in the foray. Like Jephthah, judge of Israel, of whom the mock-mad Hamlet sang to Polonius, Count William had one fair daughter and no more, the which he loved passing well. And, truth to tell, this fair young Jacqueline, the little lady of Holland, as men called her, but whom Count William, because of her fearless antics and boyish ways, called Dame Jacob, loved her knightly father with equal fervor. As she sat that day in the great hall of the knights in the massive castle at the Hague, she could see among all the knights and nobles who came from far and near to join in the festivities at Count William's court, not one that approached her father in nobility of bearing or manly strength, not even her husband. Her husband? Yes, for this little maid of thirteen had been for eight years the wife of the Dauphin of France, the young Prince John of Touraine to whom she had been married when she was scarce five years old, and he barely nine. Surrounded by all the pomp of an age of glitter and display, these royal children lived in their beautiful castle of Quenois in Flanders, now northeastern France, when they were not, as at the time of our story, residents at the court of the powerful Count William of Holland. Other young people were there too, nobles and pages and little ladies-in-waiting, and there was much of the stately ceremonial and flowery talk that in those days of knighthood clothed alike the fears of cowards and the desires of heroes, for there have always been heroes and cowards in the world. And so, between all these young folk, there was much boastful talk and much harmless gossip how the little lady of Cotroy had used the wrong corner of the towel yesterday, how the fat Duchess of Uncoisson had violated the laws of all etiquette by placing the wrong number of finger bowls upon her table on St. Jacob's Day, and how the stout young Hubert of Malson had scattered the rascal merchants of Dort at the Shrovetide Fair. Then uprose the young Lord of Arkell. Hold there, he cried hotly, 
This Hubert of Malson is but a craven, sirs, if he doth say the merchants of Dort are rascal cowards. Had they been fairly mated, he had no more dared to put his nose within the gates of Dort than dare one of you here to go down yonder amid Count William's lions. Have a care, friend Otto, said the little lady of Holland with warning finger. There is one here, at least, who dareth to go amid the lions, my father, sir. I said nothing of him, madam, replied Count Otto. I did mean these young red hats here, who do no more dare to bait your father's lions than to face the cods of Dort in fair and equal fight. At this bold speech there was instant commotion, for the nobles and merchants of Holland, four centuries and a half ago, were at open strife with one another. The nobles saw in the increasing prosperity of the merchants the end of their own feudal power and tyranny. The merchants recognized in the arrogant nobles the only bar to the growth of Holland's commercial enterprise. So each faction had its leaders, its partisans, its badges, and its followers. Many and bloody were the feuds and fights that raged through all these low-lying lands of Holland. As the nobles, or hooks as they were called, distinguished by their big red hats, and the merchants, or cods, with their slouch hats of quiet gray, struggled for the lead in the state. And how they did hate one another! Certain of the younger nobles, however, who were opposed to the reigning house of Holland, of which Count William, young Jacqueline's father, was the head, had espoused the cause of the merchants, seeing in their success greater prosperity and wealth for Holland. Among these had been the young Lord of Arkel, now a sort of half-prisoner at Count William's court, because of certain bold attempts to favor the cods in his own castle of Arkel. His defiant words, therefore, raised a storm of protest. "'Nay, then, Lord Arkel,' said the Dauphin John, "'you who prate so loudly would better prove your words by some sign of your own valor. You may have dared fight your lady mother, who so roundly punished you, therefore, but a lion hath not the tender ways of a woman. Face you the lions, Lord Count, and I will warrant me they will not prove as forbearing as did she. It was common talk at Count William's court that the brave lady of Arkel, mother of the Count Otto, had made her way disguised into a wee castle of her son, and had herself lowered the drawbridge, admitted her armed retainers, overpowered and driven out her rebellious son, and that then, relenting, she had appealed to Count William to pardon the lad and to receive him at court as hostage for his own fealty. So this fling of the Dauphins cut deep. But before the young Otto could return an angry answer, Jacqueline had interfered. "'Nay, nay, my lord,' she said to her husband, the Dauphin, "'tis not a knightly act thus to impeach the honor of a noble guest.' But now the lord of Arkel had found his tongue. "'My lord prince,' he said, bowing low with stately courtesy, if, as my lady mother and good Count William would force me, I am to be loyal vassal to you, my lieges here, I should but follow where you dare to lead. Go you into the lion's den, Lord Prince, and I will follow you though it were into old Hercules' very teeth. It was a shrewd reply, and covered as good a double dare as ever one boy made to another. Some of the manlier of the young courtiers indeed even dared to applaud. But the Dauphin John was stronger in tongue than in heart. Peste, he cried contemptuously, "'Tis a fool's answer and a fool's will, and well shall we see how you will sneak out of it all. See, Lord of Arkel, you who can prate so loudly of cods and lions, here before all I dare you to face Count William's lions yourself. The young Lord of Arkel was in his rich court suit, a tight-fitting great-sleeved silk jacket, rich violet shoes or tights, and pointed shoes. But without a word, with scarce a look toward his challenger, he turned to his nearest neighbor, a brave Zealand lad, afterward noted in Dutch history, Francis von Borselen. "'Lend me your gabardine, friend Franz, will you not?' he said. The young von Borselen took from the back of the settle over which it was flung his gabardine, the long, loose, gray cloak that was a sort of overcoat in those days of queer costume. "'It is here, my Otto,' he said. The Lord of Arkel drew the loose gray cloak over his rich silk suit and turned toward the door. Otto van Arkel lets no one call him fool or coward, Lord Prince, he said. What I have dared you all to do, I dare do, if you do not. See now, I will face Count William's lions. The Princess Jacqueline sprang up in protest. No, no, you shall not, she cried. My Lord Prince did but jest, as did we all. John, she said, turning appealingly to her young husband, who sat sullen and unmoved. Tell him you meant no such murderous test. My father, she cried, turning now toward Count William whose attention had been drawn to the dispute, the Lord of Arkel is pledged to face your lions. Count William of Holland dearly loved pluck and nerve. Well, daughter of mine, he said, then he will keep his pledge. 
Friend Otto is a brave young gallant, else had he never dared raise spear and banner as he did against his rightful liege. But my father, persisted the gentle-hearted girl, spear and banner are not lion's jaws, and surely you may not in honor permit the willful murder of a hostage. Nay, madam, have no fear, the Lord of Arkell said, bending in courteous recognition of her interest. That which I do of mine own free will is no murder, even should it fail. And he hastened from the hall. A raised gallery looked down into the spacious enclosure in which Count William kept the living specimens of his own princely badge of the lion, and here the company gathered to see the sport. With the gray gabardine drawn but loosely over his silken suit so that he might, if need be, easily slip from it, Otto van Arkel boldly entered the enclosure. So, ho, Juno, up, Hercules, hollow up, Ajax, cried Count William from the balcony. Here cometh a right royal playfellow. Up, up, my beauties. And the great brutes, roused by the voice of their master, pulled themselves up, shook themselves awake, and stared at the intruder. Boldly and without hesitation, while all the watchers had eyes but for him alone, the young lord of Arkel walked straight up to Hercules, the largest of the three, and laid his hand caressingly upon the shaggy mane. Close to his side pressed Juno, the lioness, and so, says the record of the old Dutch chronicler von Hildegspark, the lions did him no harm, he played with them as if they'd been dogs. But Ajax, fiercest of the three, took no notice of the lad. Straight across his comrades he looked to where, scarce a rod behind the daring lad, came another figure, a light and graceful form, in clinging robes of blue and undergown of cloth of gold, the Princess Jacqueline herself. The watchers in the gallery followed the lion's stare and saw with horror the advancing figure of this fair young girl. A cry of terror broke from every lip. The Dauphin John turned pale with fright, and Count William of Holland, calling out, Down, Ajax! Back, girl! Back! sprang to his feet as if he would have vaulted over the gallery rail. But before he could act, Ajax himself had acted. With a bound, he cleared the intervening space and crouched at the feet of the fair young Princess Jacqueline. The lions must have been in remarkably good humor that day, for as the records tell us, they did no harm to their visitors. Ajax slowly rose and looked up into the girl's calm face. Then the voice of Jacqueline rang out fresh and clear as, standing with her hand buried in the lion's tawny mane, she raised her face to the startled galleries. You who could dare and yet dared not to do, she cried. It shall not be said that in all Count William's court, none save the rebel Lord of Arkel dared to face Count William's lions. The Lord of Arkel sprang to his comrade's side. With a hurried word of praise, he flung the gabardine about her, grasped her arm, and bade her keep her eyes firmly fixed upon the lions. Then, step by step, those two foolhardy young persons backed slowly out of the danger into which they had so thoughtlessly and unnecessarily forced themselves. The lion's gate closed behind them with a clang. The shouts of approval and welcome sounded from the thronging gallery, and over all they heard the voice of the Lord of Holland, mingling commendation and praise with censure for the rashness of their action. And it was a rash and foolish act. But we must remember that those were days when such feats were esteemed as brave and valorous. For the Princess Jacqueline of Holland was reared in the school of so-called chivalry and romance, which in her time was fast approaching its end. She was, indeed, as one historian declares, the last heroine of knighthood. Her very title suggests the days of chivalry. She was daughter of Holland, Countess of Ponthieu, Duchess of Berry, Lady of Crevecourt, of Montague, and Arlo. Brought up in the midst of tilts and tournaments, of banquets and feasting, and all the lavish display of the rich Bavarian court, she was, as we learn from her chroniclers, the leader of adoring knights and vassals, the idol of her parents, the ruler of her soft-hearted boy husband, an expert falconer, a daring horsewoman, and a fearless descendant of those woman warriors of her race, Margaret the Empress and Philippa the Queen, and of a house that traced its descent through the warlike Hohenstaufen back to Charlemagne himself. All girls admire bravery, even though not themselves personally courageous. It is not, therefore, surprising that this intrepid and romance-reared young princess the wife of a lad for whom she never especially cared, and whose society had, for political reasons, been forced upon her, should have placed as the hero of her admiration, next to her own fearless father, not the Dauphin John of France, but this brave young rebel lad, Otto, the Lord of Arkel. 
But the joyous days of fete and pleasure at Quenois, at Paris, and The Hague, were fast drawing to a close. On the 4th of April, 1417, the Dauphin John died by poisoning in his father's castle at Compagne, the victim of these terrible and relentless feuds that were then disgracing and endangering the feeble throne of France. The dream of future power and greatness as Queen of France, in which the girl wife of the Dauphin had often indulged, was thus rudely dispelled, and Jacqueline returned to her father's court in Holland, no longer crowned princess and heiress to a throne, but simply Lady of Holland. But in Holland, too, sorrow was in store for her. Swiftly following the loss of her husband, the Dauphin, came the still heavier blow of her father's death. On the 30th of May, 1417, Count William died in his castle of Beauchin in Hainaut, and his sorrowing daughter, Jacqueline, now a beautiful girl of sixteen, succeeded to his titles and lordship as Countess and Lady Supreme of Hainaut, of Holland and of Zealand. For years, however, there have been throughout the Low Countries a strong objection to the rule of a woman. The death of Count William showed the Cods a way toward greater liberty. Rebellion followed rebellion, and the rule of the Countess Jacqueline was by no means a restful one. And chief among the rebellious spirits, as leader and counselor among the Cods, appeared the brave lad who had once been the companion of the princess in danger, the young Lord of Arkell. It was he who lifted the standard of revolt against her regency, placing the welfare of Holland above personal friendship and sinking in his desire for glory even the chivalry of that day which should have prompted him to aid rather than annoy this beautiful girl, he raised a considerable army among the knights of the Cods, or liberal party, and the warlike merchants of the cities, took possession of many strong positions in Holland, and occupied, among other places, the important town of Gorkum on the Maas. The stout citadel of the town was, however, garrisoned with loyal troops. This the Lord of Arkel besieged, and demanding its surrender, sent also a haughty challenge to the young countess, who was hastening to the relief of her beleaguered town. Jacqueline's answer was swift and unmistakable. With three hundred ships and six thousand knights and men-at-arms, she sailed from the old harbor of Rotterdam, and the lion flag of her house soon floated above the loyal citadel of Gorkin. Her doughty Dutch general, von Bredrode, counseled immediate attack, but the girl countess, though full of enthusiasm and determination, hesitated. From her station in the citadel, she looked over the scene before her. Here, along the low bank of the river Maas, stretched the camp of her own followers and the little gaily-colored boats that had brought her army up the river from the red roofs of Rotterdam. There, stretching out into the flat country beyond the straggling streets of Gorkum, lay the tents of the rebels. And yet they were all her countrymen, rebels and retainers alike. Hollanders all, they were ever ready to combine for the defense of their homeland when threatened by foreign foes or by the destroying ocean floods. Jacqueline's eye caught the flutter of the broad banner of the House of Arkel that waved over the rebel camp. Again she saw the brave lad who, alone of all her father's court save she, had dared to face Count William's lions. Again the remembrance of how his daring had made him one of her heroes, filled her heart, and a dream of what might be possessed her. Her boy husband, the French Dauphin, was dead, and she was pledged by her dying father's command to marry her cousin, whom she detested, Duke John of Brabant. But how much better, so she reasoned, that the name and might of her house as rulers of Holland should be upheld by a brave and fearless knight. On the impulse of this thought, she summoned a loyal and trusted vassal to her aid. Von Leyenberg, she said, Go you in haste and in secret to the Lord of Arkel, and bear from me this message for his ear alone. Thus says the Lady of Holland, Were it not better, Otto of Arkel, that we join hands in marriage before the altar, than that we spill the blood of faithful followers and vassals in a cruel fight? It was a singular, and perhaps to our modern ears, a most unladylike proposal. But it shows how, even in the heart of a sovereign countess and a girl general, Warlike desires may give place to gentler thoughts. To the Lord Arco, however, this unexpected proposition came as an indication of weakness. My lady countess fears to face my determined followers, he thought. Let me but force this fight and the victory is mine. In that is greater glory and more of power than being husband to the lady of Holland. 
and so he returned a most ungracious answer. "'Tell the Countess Jacqueline,' he said to the Knight of Leonberg, "'that the honour of her hand I cannot accept. I am her foe and would rather die than marry her.' All the hot blood of her ancestors flamed in wrath as young Jacqueline heard this reply of the rebel lord. "'Crush we these rebel curs, von Bredrode, she cried, pointing to the banner of Arkel, "'for by my father's memory they shall have neither mercy nor life from me.' Fast upon the curt refusal of the Lord of Arkell came his message of defiance. "'Hear ye, Countess of Holland,' rang out the challenge of the Herald of Arkell, as his trumpet blast sounded before the gate of the citadel. "'The free Lord of Arkell here giveth you word and warning that he will fight against you on the morrow.' And from the citadel came back this ringing reply as the Knight of Leonberg made answer for his sovereign lady. "'Hear ye, Sir Herald, and answer thus to the rebel Lord of Arkell. For the purpose of fighting him came we here, and fight him we will, until he and his rebels are beaten and dead. Long live our sovereign Lady of Holland! On the morrow, a murky December day in the year 1417, the battle was joined as announced. On the low plain beyond the city, knights and men-at-arms, archers and spearmen, closed in the shock of battle, and a stubborn and bloody fight it was. Seven times did the knights of Jacqueline glittering in their steel armor, clash into the rebel ranks. Seven times were they driven back, until at last the Lord of Arkel, with a fiery charge, forced them against the very gates of the citadel. The brave von Bredrod fell pierced with wounds, and the day seemed lost indeed to the Lady of Holland. Then Jacqueline the Countess, seeing her cause in danger, like another Joan of Arc, though she was indeed a younger and much more beautiful girl general, seized the lion banner of her house, and at the head of her reserved troops charged through the open gate straight into the ranks of her victorious foes. There was neither mercy nor gentleness in her heart then, as when she had cowed with a look Ajax the lion, so now with defiance and wrath in her face she dashed straight at the foe. Her disheartened knights rallied around her, and following the impetuous girl they wielded axe and lance for the final struggle. The result came quickly. The ponderous battle-axe of the Knight of Leonberg crashed through the helmet of the Lord of Arkell, and as the brave young leader fell to the ground, his panic-stricken followers turned and fled. The troops of Jacqueline pursued them through the streets of Gorkum and out into the open country, and the vengeance of the Countess was sharp and merciless. But in the flush of victory wrath gave way to pity again, and the young conqueror is reported to have said sadly and in tears, Ah, I have won, and yet how have I lost! But the knights and nobles who followed her banner loudly praised her valor and her fearlessness, and their highest and most knightly vow thereafter was to swear by the courage of our princess. The brilliant victory of this girl of sixteen was not, however, to accomplish her desires. Peace never came to her. Harassed by rebellion at home, and persecuted by her relentless and perfidious uncles, Count John of Bavaria, rightly called the pitiless, and Duke Philip of Burgundy, falsely called the good, she, who had once been Crown Princess of France and Lady of Holland, died at the early age of thirty-six, stripped of all her titles and estates. It is, however, pleasant to think that she was happy in the love of her husband, the Baron of the Forests of the Duke of Burgundy, a plain Dutch gentleman, Francis von Borselen, the lad who, years before, had furnished the grey gabardine that had shielded Count William's daughter from her father's lions. The story of Jacqueline of Holland is one of the most romantic that has come down to us from those romantic days of the knights. Happy only in her earliest and latest years, she is nevertheless a bright and attractive figure against the dark background of feudal tyranny and crime. The story of her womanhood should indeed be told if we would study her life as a whole. But for us, who can in this paper deal only with her romantic girlhood, her young life is to be taken as a type of the stirring and extravagant days of chivalry. And we cannot but think with sadness upon the power for good that she might have been in her land of fogs and floods, if, instead of being made the tool of party hate and the ambitions of men, her frank and fearless girl nature had been trained to gentle ways and charitable deeds to be the most picturesque figure in the history of Holland, as she has been called, is distinction indeed, but higher still must surely be that gentleness of character and nobility of soul that, in these days of ours, may be acquired by every girl and boy who reads this romantic story of the Countess Jacqueline, the fair young lady of Holland.
End of section 8. Caterina of Venice, the Girl of the Grand Canal, Part 9, afterward known as Queen of Cyprus and Daughter of the Republic, A.D. 1466. Who is he? Why do you not know, Caterina Mia? Tis his most puissant excellency, the mighty lord of Lusignan, the runaway heir of Jerusalem, the beggar prince of Cyprus, with more titles to his name, ho, 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 than he hath jackets to his back, and with more dodging than ducats, so tis said, when the time to pay for his lodging draweth nigh. Ho, lo, Messer Principino, give you good day, lord of Lusignan, ho, below there here is tribute for you and down upon the head of a certain sad-faced, seedy-looking young fellow in the piazza, or square beneath, descended a rattling shower of bonbons, thrown by the hand of the speaker, a brown-faced Venetian lad of sixteen. But little Caterina Cornaro, just freed from the imprisonment of her convent school at Padua, felt her heart go out in pity towards this homeless young prince, who just now seemed to be the butt for all the riot and teasing of the boys of the great republic. "'Nay, nay, my Giorgio,' she said to her brother, "'Tis neither fair nor wise so to beset one in dire distress. "'The good sisters of our school have often told us "'that tis better to be a beggar than a dullard, "'and sure yon prince, as you do say he is, "'looketh to be no dolt. "'But, ah, see there,' she cried, "'leaning far over the gaily draped balcony. "'See, he can well use his fists, can he not? "'Nay, though, tis a shame so to beset him, say I. "'Why should our lad so misuse a stranger and a prince?' It was the feast day of St. Mark, one of the jolliest of the old-time holidays of Venice, that wonderful city of the sea, whose patron and guardian St. Mark, the Apostle, was supposed to be. Gondolas, rich with draperies of every hue that completely concealed their frames of sombre black, shot in and out, and up and down all the water-streets of the beautiful city, while towering palace and humbling dwelling alike were gay with gorgeous hangings and fluttering streamers. In noticeable contrast with all the brilliant costumes and laughing faces around him was the lad who just now seemed in so dire a strait. He had paused to watch one of the passing pageants from the steps of the Palazzo Carnara, quite near the spot where, a century later, the famous bridge known as the Rialto spanned the street of the Nobles, or Grand Canal, one of the most notable spots in the history of Venice the Wonderful. The lad was indeed a prince, the representative of a lordly house that for more than five hundred years had been strong and powerful first as barons of france and later as rulers of the crusaders kingdom of jerusalem and the barbaric but wealthy island of cyprus but poor giacomo or james of lusignan royal prince though he was had been banished from his father's court in cyprus he had dared rebel against the authority of his stepmother a cruel greek princess from constantinople who ruled her feeble old husband and persecuted her spirited young stepson the prince giacomo and so with neither money nor friends to help him on, he had wandered to Venice. But Venice in 1466, a rich, proud, and prosperous city, was a very poor place for a lad who had neither friends nor money, for of course the royal prince of a little island in the Mediterranean could not so demean himself as to soil his hands with work. So I imagine that young Prince Giacomo had anything but a pleasant time in Venice. On this particular feast day of St. Mark, I am certain that he was having the most unpleasant of all his bitter experiences, as backed up against one of the columns of the Cornaro Palace, he found himself surrounded by a crowd of thoughtless young Venetians, who were teasing and bullying him to the full content of their brutal young hearts. The Italian temper is known to be both hot and hasty, but the temper of Oriental Cyprus is even more fiery, and so it was not surprising that, in this most one-sided fray, the fun soon became fighting in earnest, for anger begets anger. All about the young prince was a tossing throng of restless and angry boys, while the beleaguered lad, still standing at bay, flourished a wicked-looking stiletto above his head, and answered taunt with taunt. At this instant the door of the Cornaro Palace opened quickly, and the prince Giacomo felt himself drawn bodily within, while a bright-faced young girl with flashing eye and defiant air confronted his greatly surprised tormentors. "'Shame! shame upon you, boys of Venice!' she cried. "'Thus to ill-use a stranger in your town!' Is a score of such as you against one poor lad the boasted chivalry of Venice? Evia, the very fisher lads of Mendicola could teach you better ways. Taken quite aback by this sudden apparition in these stinging words, the boys dispersed with scarce an attempt to reply, and all the more hastily because they spied, coming up the Grand Canal, the gorgeous gondola of the Companions of the Stocking, an association of young men under whose charge and supervision all the pageants and displays of old Venice were given. So the piazza was speedily cleared, 
and the Prince Giacomo, with many words of thanks to his young and unknown deliverers, hurried from the spot which had so nearly proved disastrous to him. Changes came suddenly in those unsettled times. Within two years both the Greek stepmother and the feeble old king were dead, and Prince Giacomo, after a struggle for supremacy with his half-sister Carlotta, became king of Cyprus. Now Cyprus, though scarcely as large as the state of Connecticut, was a very desirable possession, and one that Venice greatly coveted. Some of her citizens owned land there, and among those were Marco Canaro, father of Caterina. And so it happened that soon after the accession of King Giacomo, Messer Andrea Cornaro, the uncle of Caterina, came to Cyprus to inspect and improve the lands belonging to his brother Marco. Venice in those days was so great a power that the Venetian merchants were highly esteemed in all the courts of Europe, and Uncle Andrea, who had probably loaned the new king of Cyprus a goodly store of Venetian ducats, became quite friendly with the young monarch and gave him much sage advice. One day, it seemed as if purely by accident, but those old Venetians were both shrewd and far-seeing. Uncle Andrea, talking of the glories of Venice, showed to King Giacomo a picture of his niece, Caterina Cornaro, then a beautiful girl of fourteen. King Giacomo came of a house that was quick to form friendships and antipathies, loves and hates. He fell violently in love with the picture, so the story goes, and expressed to Andrea Cornaro his desire to see and know the original. "'That face seemeth strangely familiar, Messer Cornaro,' he said. He held the portrait in his hands, and seemed struggling with an uncertain memory. Suddenly his face lighted up, and he exclaimed joyfully, "'So, I have it. Messer Cornaro, I know your niece.' "'You know her, sire?' echoed the surprised Uncle Andrea. "'Aye, that indeed I do,' said the king. "'This is the same fair and brave young maiden who delivered me from a rascal rout of boys on the Grand Canal at Venice, on St. Mark's Day, scarce two years ago.' And King Giacomo smiled and bowed at the picture, as if it were the living Caterina, instead of her simple portrait. "'Here now was news for Uncle Andrea, and you may be sure he was too good a Venetian and too loyal a Carnaro not to turn it to the best advantage.' so he stimulated the young king's evident inclination as cunningly as he was able. His niece Carolina, he assured the king, was as good as she was beautiful, and as clever as she was both. But then, he declared, Venice hath many fair daughters, sire, whom the king's choice would honour, and Caterina is but a young maid yet. Would it not be wiser, when you choose a queen, to select some older donzella for your bride? Though it will, I can aver, be hard to choose fairer. It is just such halfway opposition that renders nature like that of this young monarch all the more determined. No, King Giacomo would have Caterina, and Caterina only for his bride and queen. Messer Canaro must secure her for him. But shrewd Uncle Andrea still feared the jealousy of his fellow Venetians. Why should the house of Cornaro, they would demand, be so openly preferred? And so at his suggestion— an ambassador was dispatched to Venice, soliciting an alliance with the great republic, and asking from the senate the hand of some high-born maid of Venice in marriage for his highness the king of Cyprus. But you may be very sure that the ambassador had special and secret instructions, alike from King Giacomo and from Uncle Andrea, just how and whom to choose. The ambassador came to Venice, and soon the senate issued its commands that upon a certain day the noblest and fairest of the daughters of Venice, one from each of the patrician families, should appear in the great council hall of the ducal palace, in order that the ambassador of the king of Cyprus might select a fitting bride for his royal master. It reads quite like one of the old fairy stories, does it not? Only in this case the dragon who was to take away the fairest maiden as his tribute was no monster, but the brave young king of a lovely island realm. The palace of the Doges, the Palazzo Ducal of Old Venice, is familiar to all who have ever seen a picture of the square of St. Mark's, the best-known spot in that famous city of the sea. It is the low, rectangular, richly decorated building, with its long row of columns and arcades that stand out so prominently in photograph and engraving. It has seen many a splendid pageant, but it never witnessed a fairer sight than when on a certain bright day of the year 1468, seventy-two of the daughters of Venice, gorgeous in the rich costumes of that most lavish city of a lavish age, gathered in the great consiglio, or council hall. Up the Scala d'Oro, or golden staircase, Built only for the use of the nobles, they came, escorted by the ducal guards, gleaming in their richest uniforms. The great council hall was one mass of color, the splendid dresses of the ladies, the scarlet robes of the senators and high officials of the republic, the imposing vestments of the old doge, Cristofero Moro, as he sat in state upon his massive throne, and the bewildering array of the seventy-two candidates for a king's choice. 
seventy-two, I say, but in all that company of puffed and powdered, coiffed and combed young ladies, standing tall and uncomfortable on their ridiculously high-heeled shoes, one alone was simply dressed and apparently unaffected by the gorgeousness of her companions, the seventy-second and youngest of them all. She was a girl of fourteen, face and form were equally beautiful, and a mass of dark gold hair crowned her queenly head. While the other girls appeared nervous or anxious, she seemed unconcerned, and her face wore even a peculiar little smile, as if she were contrasting the poor badgered young prince of St. Mark's Day with the present king of Cyprus hunting for a bride. Evia, she said to herself, "'tis almost as if it were a revenge upon us for our former churlishness that he thus now puts us to shame." The ambassador of Cyprus, swarthy of face and stately in bearing, entered the great hall. With him came his attendant retinue of Cypriot nobles. Kneeling before the doge, the ambassador presented the petition of his master, the king of Cyprus, seeking alliance and friendship with Venice. "'And the better to secure this, and the more firmly to cement it, Excellenza,' said the ambassador, "'my lord and master the king doth crave from your puissant state the hand of some high-born damsel of the Republic, as that of his loving and acknowledged queen.' The old doge waved his hand toward the fair and anxious seventy-two. "'Behold, noble sir,' he said, "'the fairest and noblest of our maidens of Venice. Let your eye seek among these a fitting bride for your lord, the king of Cyprus, and it shall be our pleasure to give her to him in such a manner as shall suit the power and dignity of the state of Venice.' Courteous and stately still, but with a shrewd and critical eye, the ambassador of Cyprus slowly passed from candidate to candidate, with here a pleasant word, and there a look of admiration, to this one a honeyed compliment upon her beauty, to that one a bit of praise for her elegance of dress. How oddly this all sounds to us with our modern ideas of propriety and good taste! It seems a sort of prize-girl show, does it not? Or, it is like a competitive examination for a royal bride. But, like too many such examinations, this one had already been settled beforehand. The king had decided to whom the prize of his crown should go, and so, at the proper time, the critical ambassador stopped before a slight girl of fourteen, dressed in a robe of simple white. "'Donzella Mia,' he said courteously, but in a low tone, "'are not you the daughter of Messer Marco Canaro, the noble merchant of the Via Merceria?' "'I am, my lord,' the girl replied. "'My royal master greets you through me,' he said. "'He recalls the day when you did give him shelter, and he invites you to share with him the throne of Cyprus. Shall this be as he wishes?' And the girl, with a deep courtesy and acknowledgment of the stately obeisance of the ambassador, said simply, "'That shall be, my lord, as my father and his excellency shall say.' The ambassador of Cyprus took the young girl's hand, and, conducting her through all that splendid company, presented her before the doge's throne. "'Excellency,' he said, "'Cyprus hath made her choice. We present to you, if so it shall please your grace, our future queen, this fair young maid, Katarina the daughter of the noble Marco Canaro, merchant and senator of the Republic. What the seventy-one disappointed young ladies thought of the king's choice, or what they said about it when they were safely at home once more, history does not record. But history does record the splendors and display of the ceremonial with which the gray-haired old doge, Cristofero Moro, in the great hall of the palace, surrounded by the senators of the Republic and all the rank and power of the state of Venice, formally adopted Caterina as a daughter of the Republic. Thus to the dignity of her father's house was added the majesty of the great republic. Her marriage portion was placed at one hundred thousand ducats, and Cyprus was granted on behalf of this daughter of the republic the alliance and protection of Venice. The ambassador of Cyprus standing before the altar of St. Mark's as the personal representative of his master, King Giacomo was married by proxy to the young Venetian girl, while the doge representing her new father, the republic, gave her away in marriage and Caterina Cornaro, amid the blessings of the priests, the shouts of the people, and the demonstrations of clashing music and waving banners, was solemnly proclaimed Queen of Cyprus, of Jerusalem, and of Armenia. But the gorgeous display, before which even the fabled wonders of the Arabian Nights were but poor affairs, did not conclude here. Following the splendors of the marriage ceremony and the wedding feast came the pageant of departure. The Grand Canal was ablaze with gorgeous colors and decorations. The broad water-steps of the piazza of St. Mark were soft with carpets of tapestry, and at the foot of the stairs floated the most beautiful boat in the world, the Bucentaur or state gondola of Venice. Its high carved prow and framework were one mass of golden decorations. 
white statues of the saints, carved heads of the Lion of St. Mark, the Doge's cap, and the emblems of the Republic adorned it throughout. Silken streamers of blue and scarlet floated from its standards, and its sides were draped in velvet hangings of crimson and royal purple. The long oars were scarlet and gold, and the rowers were resplendent in suits of blue and silver. A great velvet-covered throne stood on the upper deck, and at its right was a chair of state, glistening with gold. Down the tapestried stairway came the Doge of Venice, and resting upon his arm in a white bridal dress covered with pearls, walked the girl Queen Caterina. Doge and daughter seated themselves upon their sumptuous thrones, their glittering retinue filled a beautiful boat, the scarlet oars dipped into the water, and then, with music playing, banners streaming, and a grand escort of boats of every conceivable shape, flashing in decoration and gorgeous in mingled colours, the bridal train floated down the Grand Canal, on past the outlying islands, and between the great fortresses to where, upon the broad Adriatic, the galleys were waiting to take the new queen to her island kingdom off the shores of Greece, and there, in his queer old town of Famagusta, built with a curious commingling of Saracen, Grecian, and Norman ideas, King Giacoma met his bride. So they were married, and for five happy years all went well with the young king and queen. Then came troubles. King Giacomo died suddenly from a cold caught while hunting, so it was said, though some averred that he had been poisoned, either by his half-sister Carlotta, with whom he had contended for his throne, or by some mercenary of Venice, who desired his realm for that voracious republic. But if this latter was the case, the voracious republic of Venice was not to find an easy prey. The young Queen Caterina proclaimed her baby boy King of Cyprus, and defied the great republic. Venice, surprised at this rebellion of its adopted daughter, dispatched embassy after embassy to demand submission. But the young mother was brave and stood boldly up for the rights of her son. But he too died. Then Caterina, true to the memory of her husband and her boy, strove to retain the throne intact. For years she ruled as Queen of Cyprus, despite the threatenings of her home republic and the conspiracies of her enemies. Her one answer to the demands of Venice was, Tell the republic I have determined never to remarry. When I am dead, the throne of Cyprus shall go to the state, my heir. But until that day I am Queen of Cyprus. Then her brother Giorgio, the same who in earlier days had looked down with her from the Cornaro Palace upon the outcast Prince of Cyprus, came to her as ambassador of the republic. His entreaties and his assurance that unless she complied with the Senate's demand the protection of Venice would be withdrawn, and the island kingdom left a prey to Saracen pilots and African robbers, at last carried the day. Worn out with long contending, fearful, not for herself but for her subjects of Cyprus, she yielded to the demands of the Senate, and abdicated in favour of the Republic. Then she returned to Venice. The same wealth of display and ceremonial that had attended her departure welcomed the return of this obedient daughter of the Republic, now no longer a light-hearted young girl, but a dethroned queen, a widowed and childless woman. She was allowed to retain her royal title of Queen of Cyprus, and a noble domain was given her for a home in the town of Asola, up among the northern mountains. Here, in a massive castle, she held her court. It was a bright and happy company, the home of poetry and music, the arts, and all the culture and refinement of that age, when learning belonged to the few, and the people were sunk in densest ignorance. Here Titian, the great artist, painted the portrait of the exiled queen that has come down to us. Here she lived for years, sad in her memories of the past, but happy in her helpfulness of others, until, on her way to visit her brother Giorgio in Venice, she was stricken with a sudden fever, and died in the palace in which she had played as a child. With pomp and display, as was the wont of the great republic, with a city hung with emblems of mourning, and with the solemn strains of dirge and mass filling the air, out from the great hall of the Palazzo Cornaro, on, across the heavily draped bridge that spanned the Grand Canal from the water-gate of the palace, along the broad piazza crowded with a silent throng, and into the church of the holy apostles the funeral procession slowly passed. The service closed, and in the great Cornaro tomb in the family chapel, at last was laid to rest the body of one who had enjoyed much, but suffered more, the sorrowful queen of Cyprus, the once bright and beautiful daughter of the Republic. Venice to-day is mouldy and wasting. The palace in which Caterina Cornaro spent her girlhood is now a pawnbroker's shop. The last living representative of the haughty house of Lusignan, kings in their day of Cyprus, of Jerusalem, and of Armenia, is said to be a waiter in a French café. 
so royalty withers and power fades. There is no title to nobility save character, and no family pride so unfading as a spotless name. But though palace and family have both decayed, the beautiful girl who was once the glory of Venice, and whom great artists love to paint, sends us across the ages, in a flash of regal splendor, a lesson of loyalty and helpfulness. This, indeed, will outlive all their queenly titles, and shows her to us as the bright-hearted girl who, in spite of sorrow, of trouble, and of loss, developed into the strong and self-reliant woman. End of Section 9 Section 10 of Historic Girls Teresa of Avila, the girls of the Spanish Sierras, afterward known as St. Teresa of Avila, A.D. 1525, is a stern and gray old city that the sun looks down upon when once he does show his jolly face above the saw-like ridges of the grim Guadarrama Mountains in central Spain. A stern and gray old city as well it may be, for it is one of the very old towns of western Europe, Avila, said by some to have been built by abula the mother of hercules nearly four thousand years ago whether or not it was the place in which the baby gymnast strangled the serpents who sought to kill him in his cradle it is indeed ancient enough to suit any boy or girl who likes to dig among the relics of the past for more than eight centuries the same granite walls that now surround it have lifted their gray ramparts out of the vast and granite-covered plains that make the country so wild and lonesome, while its eighty-six towers and gateways, still unbroken and complete, tell of its strength and importance in those far-off days when the cross was battling with the crescent and Christian Spain, step by step, was forcing Mohammedan Spain back to the blue Mediterranean and the arid wastes of Africa from which centuries before the followers of the arabian prophet had come at the time of our story in the year fifteen twenty five this forcing process was about over under the relentless measures of ferdinand and isabella with whose story all american children at least should be familiar the last moorish stronghold had fallen in the very year in which columbus discovered america and spain from the pyrenees to the straits of gibraltar acknowledged the mastership of its christian sovereigns but the centuries of warfare that had made the spaniards a fierce and warlike race had also filled spain with frowning castles and embattled towns and such an embattled town was this same city of Avila, in which, in 1525, lived the stern and pious old grandee Don Alfonso Sanchez de Cepeda, his sentimental and romance-loving wife, the Donna Beatrix, and their twelve sturdy and healthy children. Religious warfare, as it is the most bitter and relentless of strifes, is also the most brutal. It turns the natures of men and women into quite a different channel from the one in which the truce they are fighting for would seek to lead them, and of all relentless and brutal religious wars, few have been more bitter than the one that for fully five hundred years had wasted the land of Spain. To battle for the cross, to gain renown in fights against the infidels, as the Moors were then called, to obtain martyrdom among the followers of Mohammed these were reckoned by the christians of crusading days as the highest honor that life could bring or death bestow it is no wonder therefore that in a family the father of which had been himself a fighter of infidels and the mother a reader and dreamer of all the romantic stories that such conflicts create the children also should be full of that spirit of hatred toward a conquered foe that came from so bitter and long continuing a warfare don alfonso's religion had little in it of cheerfulness and love it was of the stern and pitiless kind that called for sacrifice and penance, and all those uncomfortable and unnecessary forms by which too many good people, even in this more enlightened day, think to ease their troubled consciences or to satisfy the fancied demands of the good father, who really requires none of these foolish and most unpleasant self-punishments. But such a belief was the rule in Don Alfonso's day, and when it could lay so strong a hold upon grown men and women, it would, of course, be likely to work in peculiar ways with thoughtful and conscientious children who, understanding little of the real meaning of sacrifice and penance, felt it their duty to do something as proof of their belief. So it came about that little ten-year-old Teresa, one of the numerous girls of the Cepeda family, thought as deeply of these things as her small mind was capable. 
She was of a peculiarly sympathetic, romantic, and conscientious nature, and she felt it her duty to do something to show her devotion to the faith for which her father had fought so valiantly, and which the nuns and priests, who were her teachers, so vigorously impressed upon her. She had been taught that, alike the punishment or the glory that must follow her life on earth, were to last forever. Forever! This was a word that even a thoughtful little maiden like Teresa could not comprehend. So she sought her mother. Forever? How long is forever, mother mine? she asked. But the Donna Beatrix was just then too deeply interested in the tragic story of the two lovers, Calixto and Melibea, and the Signor Fernando de Rojas, tear-compelling story, to be able to enter into the discussion of so deep a question. Forever, looking up from the thick and crabbed black-letter pages. Why, forever is forever, child, always. Pray do not trouble me with such questions, just as I am in the midst of this beautiful death scene, too. The little girl found she could gain no knowledge from this source, and she feared to question her stern and bigoted old father, so she sought her favorite brother Pedro a bright little fellow of seven, who adored and thoroughly believed in his sister Teresa. To Pedro, then, Teresa confided her belief that, if forever was so long a time as always, it would be most unpleasant to suffer always, if by any chance they should do anything wrong. It would be far better, so argued this little logician, to die now and end the problem, than to live and run so great a risk she told him too that as they knew from their mother's tales the most beautiful the most glorious way to die was as a martyr among the infidel moors so she proposed to pedro that she and he should not say a word to any one but just start off at once as crusaders on their own accounts and lose their lives but save their souls as martyrs among the moors the suggestion had all the effect of novelty to the little pedro and while he did not altogether relish the idea of losing his life among the moors still the possibility of a change presented itself with all the attractions that the thought of trying something new always has for children besides he had great respect for his sister's judgment well let us be crusaders he said and perhaps we need not be martyrs sister i don't think that would be so very pleasant do you who knows perhaps we may be victorious crusaders and conquer the infidels just as did rui diaz de cid see here teresa i have my sword and you can take your cross and we can have such a nice crusade and maybe the infidel moors will run away from us just as they did from the cid and leave us their cities and their gold and treasure don't you remember what mother read us how the cid won castellon with its silver and its gold the cid was the great hero of spanish romance the stories of his valor have been the joy of spaniards old and young for centuries cid is a corruption of the moorish word said or said and means master and the little fellow spouted most valiantly this portion of the famous poem of the exploits of the Cid, the Poema del Cid, with the martial spirit of which stirring rhyme his romantic mother had filled her children. Smite, smite, my knights, for mercy's sake, on boldly to the war. I am Ruiz Diaz of Bivar, the Cid Campeador. Three hundred lances then were couched, with pinions streaming gay three hundred shields were pierced through no still the shock may stay three hundred hauberks were torn off in that encounter sore three hundred snow-white pennons were crimson dyed in gore three hundred chargers wandered loose their lords were overthrown the christian cry st james for spain the mormon cry mahone theresa applauded her little brother's eloquent recitation and thought him a very smart boy but she said rather sadly i fear me it will not be that way my pedro for martyrdom means, as mother has told us, the giving up of our life rather than the bow to the false faith of the infidel, and thus to save our souls and have a crown of glory. The crown would be very nice, I suppose, sister, said practical young Pedro, especially if it was all so fine as the one they say the young King Carlos wears, emperor too now, is he not? Could we be emperors too, sister, if we were martyrs and had each a crown? But we must be crusaders first, I suppose. Come, let us go at once king charles v was at this time king of spain and had just been elected emperor of germany the road from granite walled avila to the south is across a wild and desolate waste frowned down upon on either hand by the savage crests of the grim sierras of the Guadarrama. it winds along gorges and ravines and rocky river beds and has always been even in the days of spanish power and glory about as untamed and savagely picturesque a road as one could well imagine 
along this hard and desolate road only a few days after their determination had been reached to start upon a crusade the brother and sister plotted theresa carried her crucifix and pedro his toy sword while in a little wallet at his side were a few bits of food taken from the home larder this stock of food had of course been taken without the knowledge of the mother who knew nothing of their crusade and this therefore furnished for theresa another sin for which she must do penance and another reason for the desired martyrdom they had really only proceeded a few miles into the mountains beyond a villa but already their sturdy little legs were tired and their stout little backs were sore pedro thought crusading not such very great fun after all he was always hungry and thirsty and teresa would only let him take a bite once in a while don't you suppose there is a moorish castle somewhere around here that we could capture and so get plenty to eat he inquired of his sister that is what the said was always finding don't you remember how nicely he got into alcacer and slew eleven infidel knights and found ever so much gold and things to eat this is what he said you know on on my knights and smite the foe and falter not i pray for by the grace of god i trow the town is ours this day oh pedro dear why will you think so much of things to eat groaned theresa do you not know that to be hungry is one way to be a martyr and besides it is i doubt not our just punishment for having taken anything to eat without letting mother know we must suffer and be strong little brother that's just like a girl cried pedro a trifle scornfully how can we be strong if we suffer i can't i know but before teresa could enter upon an explanation of this most difficult problem one that has troubled many older heads than little pedro's both the children started in surprise and then involuntarily shrunk closer to the dark gray rock in whose shadow they were resting for there not a hundred yards distant coming around a turn in the road was one of the very infidels they had come out to meet and conquer or be martyred by he was a rather imposing looking but not a formidable old man his cloak or mantle of brown stuff was worn and ragged his turban was quite as dingy but the long white beard that fell upon his breast made his swarthy face look even fiercer than it really was and the stout staff with which he helped himself over the uneven road seemed to the little crusader some terrible weapon of torture and of martyrdom but pedro was a valiant little fellow after all the fighting spirit of his father the don burned within him and few little folks of seven know what caution is he whispered to his sister whose hand he had at first clutched in terror a word of assurance be not afraid sister mine he said yonder comes the infidel we have gone forth to find do you suppose he has a whole great army following him hold up your crucifix and i will strike him with my sword the castle can't be far away and perhaps we can conquer this old infidel and find a good dinner in his castle that's just what the said would have done you know what he said far from our land far from castile we here are banished if with the moors we battle not i wot we get no bread let us battle with him at once and before his sister with restraining hand could hold him back the plucky young crusader flourished his sword furiously and charged down upon the old moor who now in turn started in surprise and drew aside from the path of the determined little warrior now yield thee yield thee pagan prince or die in crimson gore i am ruy diaz of bivor the said Campador shouted the little crusader charging against his pagan enemy at a furious rate oh spare him spare my brother noble emir let me die in his steed cried the terrified theresa not quite so confident now as to the pleasure of martyrdom the old man stretched out his staff and stopped the headlong dash of the boy then laying a hand lightly on his assailant's head he looked smilingly toward theresa neither prince nor emir am i christian maiden he said but the poor morisco abdelaman of cordova seeking my son ali who men say is servant to a family in valladolid pray you if you have aught to eat give some to me for i am famishing this was not exactly martyrdom it was in fact quite the opposite and the little teresa was puzzled as to her duty in the matter pedro however was not at all undecided give our bread and cake to a nasty old moor he cried i should say we will not will we sister we need it for ourselves besides what dreadful things is it that the holy inquisition does to people who succor the infidel moors theresa shuddered she knew too well all the stories of the horrible punishments that the holy office known as the inquisition of spain visited upon those who harbored jews or aided the now degraded moors 
or so complete had been the conquest of the once proud possessors of southern spain that they were usually known only by the contemptuous title of moriscos and were despised and hated by their chivalrous christian conquerors end of section ten section eleven of historic girls theresa of favilla the girl of the spanish sierras part two but little Theresa de Cepeda was of so loving and generous a nature that even the plea of an outcast and despised Morisco moved her to pity. From her earliest childhood she had delighted in helpful and generous deeds. She repeatedly gave away, so we are told, all her pocket money in charity, and any signs of trouble or distress found her ready and anxious to extend relief. There was really a good deal of the angelic in little Theresa, and even the risk of arousing the wrath of the Inquisition, the walls of whose gloomy dungeon in a villa she had, so often looked upon with awe, could not withhold her from wishing to help this poor old man who was hunting for his lost son. Nay, brother, she said to little Pedro, it can be not so very great a crime to give food to a starving man and much to pedro's disgust she opened the wallet and emptied their little store of provisions into the old beggar's hand and whither are ye bound little ones asked this tramp of the long ago as the children watched their precious dinner disappear behind his snowy beard we are on a crusade don infandel replied pedro boldly a crusade against your armies and castles perhaps to capture them and thus gain the crown of martyrdom the old moor looked at them sadly there is scarce need for that, my children, he said. My people are but slaves. Their armies and their castles are lost. Their beautiful cities are ruined, and there is neither conquest nor martyrdom for Christian use and maidens to gain among them. Go home, my little ones, and pray to Allah that you and yours may never know so much of sorrow and of trouble as do the poor Moriscos of Spain this day. This was news to Theresa. No martyrdom to be obtained among the Moors? where then was all the truth of her mother's romances where was all the wisdom of her father's savage faith she had always supposed that the moors were monsters and djinns waiting with great fires and racks and sharpest scimitars to put to horrible death all young christians who came amongst them and now here was one who begged for bread and pleaded for pity like any common beggar of a villa evidently something was wrong in the home stories as for little Pedro, he waxed more valiant as the danger lessened. He wetted his toy sword against the granite rocks and looked savagely at the old man. You have eaten all my bread, Don Infidel, he said, and now you would lie about your people and your castles. You are no beggar. You are the king of Cordova. Come here in this disguise to spy out the Christian's land. I know all about you from my mother's stories, so you must die. I shall send your head to our emperor by my sister here, and when he shall ask her who has done this noble deed, she will say, just as did Alvar Fanez de King Afonso. My Cid Campeador, O king, it was who girded Brand. The Paynim king he hath o'ercome, the mightiest in the land. Plenteous and sovereign is the spoil he from the moor hath won. This portion, honored king and lord, he sendeth to your throne so king of cordova bend down and let me cut off your head the king of cordova made no movement of compliance to this gentle invitation and the headstrong pedro springing toward him would have caught him by the beard had not his gentle sister restrained him i do believe he is no king my pedro she said but only as he says a poor morisco beggar let us rather try to help him he hath no castles i am sure and as for his armies his armies there they come look sister cried little pedro breaking into his sister's words now will you believe me and following his gaze the racer herself started as she saw dashing down the mountain highway what looked to her unpractised eyes like a whole band of moorish cavalry with glimmering lances and streaming pennons pedro faced a charge with drawn sword Theresa knelt on the ground with silver crucifix upraised, expecting instant martyrdom while the old Moorish tramp, Abdelaman, believing the discretion to be the better part of valor, quietly dropped down by the side of the rocky roadway, for well he understood who were these latest comers. The Moorish cavalry, which proved to be three Spaniards on horseback, drew up before the young crusaders. So, runaways, we have found you, cried one of them as he recognized the children. Come, Theresa, what means this folly? 
Whither are you and Pedro bound? We were even starting for a crusade against the Moor, Brother Yego, said Theresa timidly. But our infidel friend here, why, where hath he gone? Says that they are neither infidel castles nor Moorish armies now, and that therefore we may not be crusaders. But I know that he does lie, Brother Yego, cried little Pedro, more valiant still when he saw to what his Moorish cavalry was reduced. He is the king of Cordova, come here to spy out the land, and I was about to cut off his head when you did disturb us. But Brother Diego de Cepeda and the two servants of his father's house laughed long and loudly. Crusaders and kings, he cried, why we shall have the Cid himself here, if we do but wait long enough. Hush, brother, said young Pedro, confidentially. Say it not so loudly. I did tell the infidel that I was Ruy Diaz of Bivar, the Cid Campeador, and he did believe me. And then the cavalry laughed louder than ever, and swooping down captured the young crusaders and set the truants before them on their comfortable Cordova saddles. Then, turning around, they rode swiftly back to a villa with the runaways, while the old Moor, glad to escape rough handling from the Christian riders, grasped his staff and plodded on toward a villa in Valladolid. So the expedition for martyrdom and crusade came to an ignominious end. But the pious desires of little Theresa did not, for finding that martyrdom was out of the question, she proposed to her ever-ready brother that they should become hermits, and for days the two children worked away trying to build a hermitage near their father's house. But the rough and heavy pieces of granite with which they sought to build their hermitage proved more than they could handle, and their knowledge of mason work was about as imperfect as had been their familiarity with crusading in the country of the Moors. The stones that we piled one upon another, wrote Theresa herself in later years, immediately fell down, and so it came to pass that we found no means of accomplishing our wish. The pluck and piety, however, that set this conscientious and sympathetic little girl to such impossible tasks were certain to blossom into something equally hard and unselfish. When she grew to womanhood, and so it proved, her much-loved but romance-reading mother died when she was twelve years old, and Theresa felt her loss keenly. She was a very clever and ambitious girl, and with the mother's guiding hand removed, she became impatient under the restraints which her stern old father, Don Alfonso, placed upon her. At sixteen, she was impetuous, worldly-minded, and very vain, though very dignified young lady. Then her father, fearful as to her future, sent her to a convent with orders that she should be kept in strict seclusion. Such a punishment awoke all the feelings of conscientiousness and self-conviction that had so influenced her when she was a little girl, and Theresa left her own thoughts, first grew morbid, and then fell sick. During her sickness she resolved to become a nun, persuaded her ever-faithful brother Pedro to become a friar, and when Don Alfonso, their father, refused his consent, the brother and sister, repeating the folly of their childhood, again ran away from home. Then their father, seeing the uselessness of resistance, consented, and Theresa, at the age of twenty, entered a convent in a villa and became a nun in what was known as the Order of the Carmelites. The life of these nuns was strict, secluded, and silent, but the conscientious nature of Theresa found even the severities of this lonely life not sufficiently hard. In attaining to a position of influence in the order, she obtained permission from the Pope in 1562 to found a new order which should be even more strict in its rules, and therefore, so she believed, more helpful. Thus was founded the Order of Barefooted Carmelites, a body of priests and nuns who have in their peculiar way accomplished very much for charity, gentleness, and self-help in the world, and whose schools and convents have been instituted in all parts of the earth. Teresa de Cepeda died in 1582, greatly beloved and revered for her strict but gentle life, her great and helpful charities, and her sincere desire to benefit her fallen men. After her death, so great was her respect paid her that she was canonized, as it is called, that is, lifted up as an example of great goodness to the world, and she is today known and honored among devout Roman Catholics as St. Teresa of Avila. Whatever we may think of the peculiar way in which her life was spent, however we may regard the story of her troubles with her conscience, her understanding of what she deemed her duty, and her sinking of what might have been a happy and joyous life, in the solitude and severity of a convent, we cannot but think of her as one who wished to do right, and who desired above all else to benefit the world in which she lived and labored. 
her story is that of a most extraordinary and remarkable woman who devoted her life to what she deemed the thing demanded of her could we not all of us profitably attempt to live in something like a kindred spirit that helpful and unselfish one that actuated this girl of the spanish sierras here and there is born a saint theresa says george eliot founders of nothing whose loving heart beats and sobs after an unattained goodness tremble off and are dispersed among hindrances instead of centering in some long recognizable deed but if a girl or boy desiring to do right will disregard the hindrances and not simply sit and sob after an unattained goodness if instead they will but do the duty nearest at hand manfully and well the reward will come in something even more desirable than a long recognizable deed it will come in the very self-gratification that will at last follow every act of courtesy of friendliness and of self-denial and such a life will be of more real value to the world than all the deeds of all the crusaders or than even the stern and austere charities of a saint theresa end of section eleven section twelve of historic girls elizabeth of tudor the girl of the hartford manor afterward queen elizabeth of england the good queen bess a d fifteen forty eight the iron shot hoofs of the big grey courser rang sharply on the frozen ground as beneath the creaking bows of the long armed oaks launcelot crew the lord protectors flitters courserman galloped across the hartford fells or hills and reined up his horse within the great gates of hartfield manor house from the lord protector he said and master avery mitchell the fieldery who had been closely watching for his same courserman for several anxious hours took from his hands a scroll on which was inscribed to avery mitchell fieldery of the wards in herds at hellfield house from the lord protector these and next the courserman in secrecy unscrewed one of the bullion buttons of his buff jerkin and taking from it a scrap of paper handed this also to the watchful fieldery then his mission ended he repaired to the buttery to satisfy his lusty english appetite with a big dish of pasty followed by earl and wardens as certain hot pears used chiefly for cooking were called in those days while the cautious avery michel unrolling the scrap of paper read in secrecy this under guise of murmurs place a half-score good men and true in your youth tight masking well armed and safely conditioned they will be there who shall command look for the green dragon of wantley on your allegiance this from you be too scarcely had the fiddery read re-read and then destroyed the secret and singular missive when the ho hello of her grace the princess outriders rang on the crypt's december air and there galloped up to the broad doorway of the manor house a gaily costumed train of lords and ladies with huntsmen and falconers and yeomen following on behind central in the group flushed with a hot gallop through the wintry air a young girl of fifteen tall and trim in figure set her horse with the easy grace of a practised and confident rider her long velvet habit was deeply edged with fur and both curter and headgear were of a rich purple tinge while from beneath the latter just peeped a heavy coil of sunny golden hair her face was fresh and fair as should be that of any young girl of fifteen but its expression was rather that of high spirits and of heedless and impetuous moods than of simple maidenly beauty tilly wally my lord she cried dropping her bridal rein into the hands of a waiting groom it was my race to-day was it not odds fish meant she cried out sharply to the attendant groom ye are easier with roland's brighter there one beast of his gentle matter were worth a score of clumsy warlers like to you well said i not right my lord admiral is not the race fairly mine i asked and callous in act as in speech she gave the lord admiral's horse as she spoke so sharp a cart with her riding whip as to make the big brute rear in sudden surprise and almost unhorse its rider while an unchecked laugh came from its fair tormentor good faith mistress answered sir thomas seymour the lord high admiral gracefully swallowing his exclamation of surprise your ladyship hath fairly won and sure 
hath no call to punish both myself and my good Selim, here by such unwarranted chastisement. Will your grace dismount? And, vaulting from his seat, he gallantly extended his hand to help the young girl from her horse, while on the same instant another in her train, a handsome young fellow of the girl's own age, knelt on the frozen ground and held her stirrup. But this independent young maid would have none of their courtesies. Ignoring the outstretched hands of both the man and boy, she sprang lightly from her horse, and as she did so, with a slight and sudden push of her dainty foot, she sent the kneeling lad sprawling backward, while her merry peal of laughter rang out as an accompaniment to his downfall. Without your help, my lords, without your help, so please you both, she cried. Why, Dudley, she exclaimed in mock surprise, as she threw a look over her shoulders at the prostrate boy. Are you there? Beshrew me, though, you do look like one of good men Rogers' docking cocks in the poultry yonder. So red and rougher of feather do you seem. There, see now, I do repent me of my discourtesy. You, Sir Robert, shall squire me to the hall, and Lord Seymour must even content himself with playing the gallant to good Mistress Ashley. And, leaning on the arm of the now pacified Dudley, the self built girl tripped lightly up the entrance steps. self built and thoughtless, even rude and oitendish, we may think her in these days of gentler manners and more guarded speech, but those were less refined and cultured times than this in which we live, and the rough uncurbed nature of King Henry the Eighth, of most famous memory as the old chroniclers termed the bluff King Hell, reappeared to a noticeable extent in the person of his second child, the daughter of ill fated Anne Boleyn, my lady's grace, the Princess Elizabeth of England. And yet, we should be readier to excuse this impetuous young princess of three hundred years ago than were even her associates and enemies. For enemies she had, poor child, envious and vindictive ones, who sought to work her harm. Married and unhappy had her young life already been. Born amid splendid hopes in the royal palace of Greenwich, called Elizabeth after that grandmother, the fair heiress of the house of York, whose marriage to a prince of the house of Lancaster had ended the long and cruel war of the roses. She had been welcomed with the peal of bells and the boom of cannon, and christened with all the regal ceremonial of King Henry's regal court. Then, when scarcely three years old, disgraced by the wicked murder of her mother, cast off and repudiated by her brutal father, and only received again to favour at the christening of her baby brother, passing her childish days in grim old castles and a wicked court, she found herself at thirteen, fatherless as well as motherless, and at fifteen, cast on her own resources, the sport of men's ambitions and of conspirators' schemes. Today, the girl of fifteen, tenderly red, shielded from trouble by a mother's watchful love and a father's loving care, can know but little of the dangers that compass this princess of England, the Lady Elizabeth. Deliberately separated from her younger brother, the king, by his unwise and selfish counsellors, hated by her elder sister, the Lady Mary, as the daughter of the woman who had made her mother's life so miserable, she was, even in her manor home of Hatfield, where she should have been most secure, in still greater jeopardy. For this same Lord Seymour of Sotley, who was at once Lord High Admiral of England, uncle to the king, and brother of Somerset, the Lord Protector, had by fair promises and lavish gifts bound to his purpose this defenceless girl's only protectors, Master Perry, her cofferer, or steward, and Mistress Catherine Ashley, her governess. And that purpose was to force the young princess into a marriage with himself, so as to help his schemes of treason against the Lord Protector, and get into his own hands the care of the boy king and the government of the realm. It was a bold plot, and if unsuccessful, men attained her, and death for high treason. But Seymour, ambitious, reckless, and unprincipled, thought only of his own desires, and cared little for the possible wound into which he was dragging the unsuspecting and orphan daughter of the king who had been his ready friend and patron. So matters stood at the period of our star, on the eve of the Christmas festivities of 1548 
as, on the arm of her boy as court, Sir Robert Dudley, gentleman usher at King Edward's court, and, years after, the famous Earl of Lancaster of Queen Elizabeth's day, the royal maiden entered the hall of Hatfield House, and, within the great hall, she was greeted by Master Perry, her cofferer, Master Rontian, her yeoman of the robes, and Master Michel, the feudary. Then, with a low obeisance, the feudary presented her the scroll which had been brought him post haste by Launcelot Crewe, the coarser man. What, good Master Avery! exclaimed Elizabeth as she ran her eye over the scroll. You to be Lord of Misrule and Master of the Rivers and by my lord of somerset's own appointing i am right glad to learn it and this is what she read in promise i give leave to every mitchell fieldery gentleman to be lord of misrule of all good orders at the manor of hatfield during the twelve days of yuletide and also i give free leave to the said every mitchell to command all and every person or persons whatsoever as well servants as others to be at his command whensoever he shall sound his trumpet or music and to do him good service as though i were present myself at their perils i give full power and authority to his lordship to break all locks bolts bars doors and latches to come at all those who presume to disobey his lordship's commands god save the king somerset it was christmas eve the great hall of Hatfield House gleamed with the light of many candles that flashed upon the sconce and armour and polished floor. Holly and mistletoe, rosemary and bay, and all the decorations of an old-time English Christmas were tastefully arranged. A burst of laughter ran through the hall, as through the ample doorway, and down the broad stair, trooped the motley train of the Lord of Misrule to open the Christmas revels a fierce and ferocious looking fellow was he with his great green moustache and his ogre-like face his dress was a gorgeous party-coloured jerky and half hose trunks rough slouch boots of cordova leather and high the feathered steeple hat his long staff topped with a fool's head cap and bells rang loudly on the floor as preceded by his diminutive but pompous page he led his train around and around the great hall lustily singing the chorus like prince and king he leads the ring right merrily we go sing hey tricks trim go tricks under the mr toe a menagerie let loose or the most despotic of after-dinner dreams could not be more bewildering than was this motley train of the lord of misrule giants and dwarfs dragons and griffins hobby horses and goblins robin hood and the grand turk bears and balls and fantastic animals that never had a name boys and girls men and women in every imaginable costume and device around and around the hall they went still ringing out the chorus sing hey tricks trim go tricks under the mr toe then standing in the centre of his court the lord of misrule bade his herald declare that from christmas eve to twelfth night he was lord supreme that with his magic art he transformed all there into children and charged them on their filthy to add only as such i absolve them all from wisdom he said i bid them be just wise enough to make fools of themselves and do decree that none shall sit apart in pride and ache in self-sufficiency to laugh at others and then the fun commenced off in stately whitehall in the palace of the boy king her brother the revels were grander and showier but to the young elizabeth not yet skilled in all the stiffness of the royal court the yule-tide feast at hatfield house brought pleasure enough and so seated at her holly trim virginal that great-great-grandfather of the piano of the day she whose rescue as a musician has come down to us would when varied with her pranks and japes help through some fitting christmas carol or that older lay of the yule-tide mumming to shorten winter sadness see where the folks with gladness disguised are all a coming right wantonly a mumming voila whilst youthful sports are lasting to feasting turn out fasting with revels and with wassails make grief and care our vessels voila the yule log had been noisily dragged into the firing and as the big sparks raced up the white chimney the ball's head and the tankard of sack the great christmas candle and the christmas pie were escorted around the room to the flourish of trumpets and welcoming shouts the lord of misrule 
with a wave of his staff, was about to give the order for all to unmask, when suddenly there appeared in the circle a new character, a great green dragon, as fierce and ferocious as well could be. From his pasteboard jaws to his curling canvas tail, the green dragon of Wantley, terrified urchins back hastily away from his horrible jaws, and the lot of Miss Rue gave a sudden and visible start. The dragon himself, scarce waiting for the surprise to subside, waved his paw for silence, and said in a hollow, paced body void, Most noble lot of Miss Rue, before your feast commences and the mask are doffed, may we not as that we should give good appetite to all, with your lordship's permit and that of my lady's grace, tell each arm one the filling tale as suits the goodly time of you? Here be stout maskers can tell us strange tales of fairies and goblins, or perchance of the foreign folk with whom they have traffic in Calicu and Africa, Herbaria, Peru, and other diverse lands and countries oversea. And after they have ended, then will I essay a tale that shall cap them all, so past belief shall it appear. The close of the dragon's speech, of course, made them all the more curious, and the lady Elizabeth did but speak for all when she said, I pray you, good Sir Dragon, let us have your tale first. We have had enough of a bay rear and Peru. If that yours may be so wondrous, let us hear it even now, and then may we decide. As your lady's grace wishes, said the dragon, but methinks when you have heard me true, you would that it had been the last or else not told at all. Your lordship of Miss Rue and my lady's grace must know, began the dragon, that my story, though a short, is a startling one. Once on a time there lived a king who, though but a boy, did by God's grace, in talent, industry, perseverance, and knowledge, surpass both his own years and the belief of man. And because he was good and gentle alike in condition beyond the measure of his years, he was the greater prey to the wicked wiles of treacherous men. And one such, high in the king's court, thought to work him ill, and to carry out his ends did wantonly awaken seditious and rebellious intent even among the king's kith and kin, whom lie traitorously sought to wed. His royal and younger sister, nay, start, not my lady's grace, exclaimed the dragon quickly as Elizabeth turned upon him a look of sudden and haughty surprise. All is none, and this is the ending of my wondrous tale. My lord Seymour of Sutley is this day taken for high treason and held to the tower. They of your own household are held as accomplice to the lord amorous, wicked intent, and you, Lady Elizabeth Tudor, are by order of the council to be restrained in prison wards in this your manner of Hatfield until such time as the king's majesty and the honourable council shall decide this on your allegiance the cry of terror that the dragon's words awoke died into silence as the lady elizabeth rose to her feet flushed with anger is this a favour or the posy of a ring sir dragon she said sharply do you come to try or tempt me or is this perchance but some part of my lot of miss rule's ill tight mumming Blood, sir only craven sneak behind masks to strike and threaten. Have off your disguise if you be a true man. Or by my word as princess of England, he shall bitterly rue the day who dares to be fooled the daughter of Henry Tudor. As you will, then, my lady, said the dragon. Do you doubt me now? And tearing off his pasteboard wrapping, he stood disclosed before them all as a grim Sir Robert Trevitt, chief examiner of the Lord Protector's Council. Move not at your peril, he said, as a stir in the trunk seemed to indicate the presence of some brave spirit who would have shielded their young princess. Master Fudery, beat your wallets then to their arms, and at a word from Master Avery Michel, late lord of Misrule, there flashed from beneath the cloaks of certain tall figures on the circus edge of the halberd of the guard. The surprise was complete. The Lady Elizabeth was a prisoner in her own manor house and the youth-tide rebels had reached a sudden and sorry ending. And yet once again under this false accusation did the hot spirit of the Tudors flame in the face and speech of the Princess Elizabeth. Sir Robert Trevitt, cried the brave young girl, these be but lying rumours that do go against my honour and my fealty. God knows they be shameful slanders, sir, for the wish, 
besides the desire I have to see the King's Majesty, I pray you let me also be brought straight before the court, that I may disprove these perjured tongues. But her appeal was not granted. For months she was kept close prisoner at Hatfield House, subject daily to most rigid cross-examination by Sir Robert Trevitt for the purpose of implicating her if possible in the Lord Emerus plot, but all in vain. And at last even Sir Robert gave up the attempt, and wrote to the council that the Lady Elizabeth has a good wit, and nothing is gotten of her but by great policy. Lord Seymour of Sutley was beheaded for treason on Tower Hill, and others implicated in his plots were variously punished, but even great policy cannot squeeze a lie out of the truth, and Elizabeth was finally declared free of the stain of treason. Experience, which is a hard teacher, often brings to light the best that is in us. It was so in this case, for, as one writer says, the long and harassing ordeal disclosed the splendid courage, the reticence, the rare description, which were to carry the princess through many an awful peril in the years to come. Probably no event of her early girlhood went so far toward making a woman of Elizabeth as did this miserable affair. Within ten years thereafter, the Lady Elizabeth ascended the throne of England. Those ten years covered many strange events, many varying fortunes, the death of her brother, the boy King Edward, the sad tragedy of Lady Jane Grey, Wyatt's rebellion, the Tanner's revolt, and all the long horror of the reign of Bloody Mary. You may read all of this in history, and may see how, through it all, the young princess grew still more firm of will, more self-reliant, wise and strong, developing all those peculiar qualities that helped to make her England's greatest queen, and one of the most wonderful women in history. But through all her long and most historic life, a life of over seventy years, forty-five of which were passed as England's queen, Scarce any incident made so lasting an impression upon her as when in Hatfield House the first shock of the false charge of treason fell upon the toddler's girl of fifteen in the midst of the Christmas revels. End of section twelve. Section thirteen of Historic Girls. Christina of Sweden, the girl of the northern fjords. A.D. sixteen thirty-six. There were tears and trouble in Stockholm. There was sorrow in every house and hamlet in Sweden. There was consternation throughout Protestant Europe. Gustavus Adolphus was dead. The Lion of the North had fallen on the bloody and victorious field of Lutzen, and only a very small girl of six stood as the representative of Sweden's royalty. The state of Sweden that is, the representatives of the different sections and peoples of the kingdom, gathered in haste within the Ridder House, or Hall of Assembly, in Stockholm. There was much anxious controversy over the situation. The nation was in desperate strait, and some were for one thing and some were for another. There was even talk of making the government a republic, like the state of Venice, and the supporters of the King of Poland cousin to the dead king Gustavus, openly advocated his claim to the throne. But the Grand Chancellor, Axel Oxenstiern, one of Sweden's greatest statesmen, acted promptly. Let there be no talk between us, he said, of Venetian republics or of Polish kings. We have but one king, the daughter of the immortal Gustavus. Then up spoke one of the leading representatives of the peasant class, Lars Larsson, the deputy from the western fjords. "'Who is this daughter of Gustavus?' he demanded. "'How do we know this is no trick of yours, Axel Östenstian? "'How do we know that King Gustavus has a daughter? "'We have never seen her.' "'You shall see her at once,' replied the Chancellor, "'and leaving the hall for an instant, "'he returned speedily, leading a little girl by the hand. "'With a sudden movement he lifted her "'to the seat of the high silver throne,' that could only be occupied by the kings of Sweden. Swedes, behold your king! Lars Larsson, the deputy, pressed close to the throne, on which the small figure perched silent, yet with a defiant little look upon her face. She hath the face of the grand Gustavus, he said. Look, brothers, the nose, the eyes, the very brows are his. Aye, 
said Oxenstiern, and she's a soldier's daughter. I myself did see her, when scarce three years old, clap her tiny hands and laugh aloud when the guns of Kalmar Fortress thundered a salute. She must learn to bear it, said Gustavus our king. She is a soldier's daughter. Hail, Christina! shouted the assembly, won by the proud bearing of the little girl and by her likeness to her valiant father. We will have her, and only her, for our queen. Better yet, brothers, cried Lars Larsson, now her most loyal supporter. She sits upon the throne of the kings. Let her be proclaimed king of Sweden. And so it was done, and with her wavering loyalty kindled into a sudden flame, the states of Sweden gave a mouthy shout and cried as one man, Hail, Christina, king of Sweden! There was strong objection in Sweden to the rule of a woman, and the education of this little girl was rather that of a prince than of a princess. She was taught to ride and to shoot, to hunt and to fence, to undertake all of the boy's exercises, and to endure all a boy's privations. She could bring down a hare, at the first shot, from the back of a galloping horse. She could outride the most expert huntsman in her train. So she grew from childhood into girlhood, and at thirteen was as bold and fearless, as willful and self-possessed as any young fellow of twenty-one. But besides all this, she was a wonderful scholar. Indeed, she would be accounted remarkable even in these days of bright girl graduates. At thirteen, she was a throughout Greek scholar. She was learned in mathematics and astronomy, the classics, history, and philosophy, and she acquired of her own accord German, Italian, Spanish, and French. Altogether, this girl queen of the north was a strange compound of scholar and hoyden, pride and carelessness, ambition and indifference, culture and rudeness, as ever, before her time or since, were combined in the nature of a girl of thirteen. And it is thus that our story finds her. One raw October morning in the year 1639, there was a stir and excitement at the palace in Stockholm. A courier had arrived, bearing important dispatches to the consul of regents, which covered Sweden during the minority of the queen, and there was no one to officially meet him. Closely following the lackey who received him, the courier strode into the council room of the palace. But the council room was vacant. It was not a very elegant apartment, this council room of the palace of the kings of Sweden, Although a royal apartment, its appearance was ample proof that the art of decoration was as yet unknown in Sweden. The room was untidy and disordered. The council table was strewn with the ungathered litter of the last day's council, and even the remains of a coarse lunch mingled with all this clutter. The uncomfortable-looking chairs all were out of place, and above the table was a sort of temporary canopy to prevent the dust and spider's web upon the ceiling from dropping upon the councillors. The courier gave a sneering look upon this evidence that the refinement and culture which marked at least the palaces and castles of other European countries were yet as little considered in Sweden. Then, important and impatient, he turned to the attendant. Well, he said, and is there none here to receive my dispatches? They call for... Hoof! So, what manners are these? What manners, indeed! The courier might well ask this, for, plump against him, as he spoke, dashed, first a girl, and then a boy who had darted from somewhere into the council chamber. Too absorbed in their own concerns to notice who, if any one, was in the room, they had run against and very nearly upset the astonished bearer of dispatches. Still more astonished was he, when the girl, using his body as a barrier against her pursuer, danced and dodged around him to avoid being caught by her pursuer a fine-looking young lad of about her own age, Carl Gustav, her cousin, the scandalized bearer of dispatches to the Swedish council of regents, shook himself free from the girl's strong grasp and, seizing her by the shoulders, demanded sternly, "'How now, young mistress? Is it seemly conduct towards a stranger and an impartial courier?' The girl now for the first time noticed the presence of a stranger, too excited in her mad dash into the room to distinguish him from one of the palace servants, she only learned the truth by the courier's harsh words. A sudden change came over her. She drew herself up haughtingly and said to the attendant, 
"'And who is this officious stranger, class? The tone and manner of the question again surprised the courier, and he looked at the speaker, amazed. What he saw was an attractive young girl of thirteen, short of stature, with bright hazel eyes, a vivacious face, now almost stern in its expression of pride and haughtiness. A man's fur cap rested upon the mass of tangled light brown hair which, tied imperfectly with a simple knot of ribbon, fell down upon her neck. Her short dress of plain grey stuff hung loosely about a rather trim figure, and a black scarf, carelessly tied, encircled her neck. In short, he saw a rather pretty, carelessly dressed, healthy, and just now very haughty-looking young girl, who seemed more like a boy in speech and manners, and one who needed to be disciplined and curbed. Again the question came, "'Who is this man, and what seeks he here, class? I ask. "'Tis a courier with dispatches for the council, madam,' replied the man. "'Give me the dispatches,' said the girl. "'I will attend to them.' "'You, indeed!' the courier laughed grimly. "'The dispatches from the Emperor of German are for no harebrained maid to handle. "'These are to be delivered to the Council of Regents alone.' "'I will have naught of councils or regents, Sir Courier, say when it pleases me,' said the girl, tapping the floor with an angry foot. "'Give me the dispatches, I say. I am the King of Sweden.' Y "'You are a girl king?' was all the astonished Courier could stammer out. Then, as the real fact dawned upon him, he knelt at the feet of the young queen and presented his dispatches. "'Withdraw, sir,' said Christina, taking the papers from his hand, with but the scant courtesy of a nod. "'We will read this and return a suitable answer to your master.' The courier withdrew, still dazed at this strange turn of affairs, and Christina, leaning carelessly against the council table, opened the dispatches. Suddenly she burst into a merry but scarcely ladylike laugh. <laughs> this is too rare of a joke, Carl, she cried. Lord Chancellor, Matthias, Torstensen, she exclaimed, as these members of her council entered the apartment. What think you? Here come dispatches from the Emperor of German, begging that you, my council, shall consider the wisdom of wedding me to his son and thereby closing the war. His son, indeed! Ferdinand the Craven! And yet, madam, suggested the wise Oxenstiern, it is a matter that should not lightly be cast aside. In time you must needs to be married. The constitution of the kingdom doth oblige you to. Oblige? The young girl turned upon the grey-headed chancellor almost savagely. Oblige? And who, Sir Chancellor, upon earth shall oblige me to do so, if I do it not of mine own will? Say not oblige to me. This was a vigorous language for a girl of scarce fourteen, but it was Christina's way, one with which both the council and the people soon grew familiar. It was the vasa nature of her, and it was always prominent in this spirited young girl, the last descendant of that masterful house. Vasa was the family name of her father, and the ancient king of Sweden. But now the young prince Carl Gustavus had something to say. Ah, cousin mine, and he laid a strong though boyish hand upon the young girl's arm. What need for carriers or dispatches that speak of suitors for your hand? Am I not to be your husband? From babyhood you have so promised me. Christina again broke into a um, loud and merry laugh. <laughs> Hark to the little burgo, master, she cried. Much travel hath made him, I do fear me, soft in heart and head. Childish promises, Carl. Let such things be forgotten now. You are to be a soldier, I a queen. And yet, madam, said Matthias, her tutor, all Europe hath for years regarded Prince Carl as your future husband. And what care I for that? demanded the girl hotly. Have done, have done, sirs. You do weary me with all this. Let us to the hunt. Axel Dag did tell me of a fine rubuck in the Maela woods. See you to the courier of the emperor, and to his dispatches, Lord Chancellor. I care not what you tell him. If you do but tell him no, and say, Where is that round little Dutchman, Van Bunigen, whom you did complain but yesterday was sent among us by his government to oppose the advices of our English friends? He is a greater schooler than a horseman, or I mistake. 
Let us take him in our hunting party, Carl, and see to it that he doth have one of our choicest horses. The girl's mischief was catching. Her cousin dropped his serious look, and, seeking the Dutch envoy, with due courtesy invited him to join the Queen's hunt. "'Give him black Hannibal juice,' Christina said to her groom, and when the Dutch envoy, Van Bernigen, came out to join the hunting party, too much flattered by the invitation to remember that he was a poor horseman, Juice, the groom, held Black Hannibal in unsteady check, while the big horse champed and fretted, and the hunting party awaited the new member. But Juice, the groom, noted the Dutchman's somewhat alarmed look at the big black animal. "'Would it not be well, good sir,' he said, "'that you do choose some steadier animal than Hannibal here? I pray you let me give you one less restive. So, Broer Andersson, he called to one of the undergrooms, let a noble envoy have your cob, and take you black Hannibal to the stables. But no, the envoy of the States of Holland would submit to no such change. He ride a servant's horse indeed. Why, sir and groom, he said to good-hearted Jews, I would have you know that I am no novice in the equestrian art. Far from it, man. I have read every treatise on the subjects from Xenophon downward and what horse can know more than I? So friendly Jews had nothing more to say, but hoisted the puffed-up Dutch scholar into the high saddle, and away galloped to hunt toward the Mela woods. As if blind to his own folly, Van Bernigen, the envoy, placed himself near the young queen, and Christina, full of her own mischief, began gravely to compliment him on his horsemanship, and suggested a gallop. Alas, fatal moment! for while he yet swayed and jolted upon the back of the restive Hannibal, and even endeavoured to discuss with the fair young schooler who rode beside him the Melanip of Euripides, the same fair schooler, who, in spite of all her Greek learning, was only a mischievous and sometimes very rude young girl, faced him with a sober countenance. "'Good her, Vanny Bernigan. "'Your Greek is truly as smooth as your face.' but it seems to me you do not sufficiently catch the spirit of the poet's lines commencing. I should rather say that Grtu Gelvots should be. Just what Grtu Gelvots should be she never declared, for as the envoy of Holland turned upon her face, on which Greek learning and anxious horsemanship struggled with one another, Christina slyly touched Black Hannibal lightly with her riding whip. Light as the touch was, however, it was enough. The unruly horse reared and plunged. The startled schooler, with a cry of terror, flung up his hands, and then clutched Black Hannibal round the neck. Thus, in the manner of John Gilpin, his horse who never in that way had handled been before, but the thing upon his back had got did wonder more and more. Away went Gilpin neck and naught, away went hat and wig. He never dreamed when he set out of running such a rig. Minus hat and wig, too, the poor envoy dashed up the Maile highway, while Christina, laughing loudly, galloped after him in a mad race, followed by all her hunting party. The catastrophe was not far away. The black horse, like the ill-tempered bronchos of our western plains, bucked suddenly, and over his head like a flash went the discomfited, went the discomfited Dutchman. In an instant, Greek learning and Dutch diplomacy lay sprawling in a Swedish roadway, from which Jews, the groom, speedily lifted the groaning would-be horseman. Even in her seal for study, really remarkable in so young a girl, Christina could not forego her misguided love of power and her tendency to practical joking, and one day she even made two grave philosophers, who were holding a profound discussion in her presence over some deep philosophic subject, suddenly seized their arguments, to play with her at battledore and shuttlecock. A girlhood of uncontrolled power, such as hers, could lead but to one result. Self-gratification is the worst form of selfishness, and never can work good to anyone. Although she was a girl of wonderful capabilities, of the blood of famous kings and conquerors, giving such promises of greatness that scholars and statesmen alike prophesied for her a splendid future. Christina, Queen of Sweden, made only a failure of her life. At eighteen she had herself formally crowned as King of Sweden, but at twenty-five she declared herself sick and tired of her duties as Queen, 
and at twenty-eight at the height of her power and fame she actually did resign her throne in favour of her cousin prince karl publicly abdicated and at once left her native land to lead the life of a disappointed wanderer the story of this remarkable woman is one that holds a lesson for all eccentric careless and fearless handsome witty and learned ambitious shrewd and visionary she was one of the strangest compounds of unlikes to be met with in history she deliberately threw away a crown wasted a life that might have been helpful to her subjects regarded only her own selfish and personal desires and died a prematurely old woman at sixty-five unloved and unhonoured her story if it teaches anything assures us that it is always best to have in youth whether as girl or boy the guidance and direction of some will that is acknowledged and respected natures unformed or overindulged with none to counsel or command generally go wrong a mother's love a father's care these though young people may not always read them aright are needed for the moulding of character while to every bright young girl historic or unhistoric princess or peasant swedish queen or modern american maiden will it at last be apparent that the right way is always the way of modesty and gentleness of high ambitions perhaps but always and everywhere of thoughtfulness of for others and kindliness to all end of section thirteen section fourteen of historic girls matauka of the powhatan the girl of the virginia forests throughout that portion of the easterly united states where the noble bay called the chesapeake cuts virginia in two and where the james broadest of all the rivers of the old dominion rolls its glistening waters toward the sea there lived years ago a notable race of men for generations they had held the land and though their clothing was scanty and their customs odd they possessed many of the elements of character that are esteemed noble and had they been left to themselves they might have progressed so people who have studied into their character now believe into a fairly advanced stage of what is known as barbaric civilization they lived in long low houses of bark and boughs each house large enough to accommodate perhaps from eighty to a hundred persons twenty families to a house these long houses were therefore much the same in purpose as are the tenement houses of to-day save that the tenements of that far-off time were all on the same floor and were open closets or stalls about eight feet wide furnished with bunks built against the wall and spread with deerskin robes for comfort and covering these flats or stalls were arranged on either side of a broad central passageway and in this passageway at equal distances apart fire pits were constructed the heat from which would warm the bodies and cook the dinners of the occupants of the longhouse each fire serving the purpose of four tenements or families in their mode of life these people tall well-made attractive and coppery-colored folk were what is now termed communists that is they lived from common stores and had an equal share in the land and its yield the products of their vegetable gardens their hunting and fishing expeditions their home labors and their household goods their method of government was entirely democratic no one in any household was better off or of higher rank than his brothers or sisters their chiefs were simply men and sometimes women who had been raised to leadership by the desire and vote of their associates but who possessed no special authority or power except such as was allowed them by the general consent of their comrades in view of their wisdom bravery or ability they lived in fact as one great family bound in close association by their habits of life and their family relationships and they knew no such unnatural distinction as king or subject lord or vassal around their long bark tenements stretched carefully cultivated fields of corn and pumpkins the trailing bean the full-bunched grapevine the juicy melon 
and the big leaf taba or tobacco the field work was performed by the women not from any necessity of a slavish condition or an enforced obedience but because where the men and boys must be warriors and hunters the women and girls felt it was their place and their duty to perform such menial labor as to their unenlightened nature seemed hardly suitable to those who were to become chiefs and heroes these sturdy forest folk of old virginia who had reached that state of human advance midway between savagery and civilization that is known as barbarism were but a small portion of that red-skinned vigorous and most interesting race familiar to us under their general but wrongly used name of indians they belonged to one of the greatest divisions of this barbaric race known as the algonquin family a division created solely by a similarity of language and of blood relationships and were therefore of the kindred of the indians of canada of new england and of pennsylvania of the valley of the ohio the island of manhattan and of some of the far-away lands beyond the mississippi so for generations they lived with their simple home customs and their family affections with their games and sports their legends and their songs their dances fasts and feasts their hunting and their fishing their tribal feuds and wars they had but little religious belief save that founded upon the superstition that lies at the foundation of all uncivilized intelligence and though their customs show a certain strain of cruelty in their nature this is not a savage and vindictive cruelty but was rather the result of what was from their way of looking at things an entirely justifiable understanding of order and law at the time of our story certain of these algonquin tribes of virginia were joined together in a sort of indian republic composed of thirty tribes scattered through central and eastern virginia and known to their neighbors as the confederacy of the powhatans this name was taken from the tribe that was at once the strongest and the most energetic one in this tribal union and that had its fields and villages along the broad river known to the indians as the powhatan and to us as the james the principal chief of the powhatans was wabun sanakuk called by the white man powhatan he was a strongly built but rather stern-faced old gentleman of about sixty and possessed such an influence over his tribesmen that he was regarded as the head man president we might say of the first republic which comprised the thirty confederated tribes of powhatan the confederacy in its strongest days never numbered more than eight or nine thousand people and yet it was considered one of the largest indian unions in america this therefore may be considered as pretty good proof that there was never after all a very extensive indian population in america even before the white man discovered it into one of the powhatan villages that stood very near the shores of chesapeake bay and almost opposite the now historic site of yorktown came one biting day in the winter of sixteen o seven an indian runner whose name was Rabunta. he came as one that had important news to tell but he paused not for shout or question from the inquisitive boys who were trembling about in the light snow in their favorite sport of gawasa or the snow snake game one of the boys a mischievous and sturdy young indian of thirteen whose name was nantaquatlus even tried to insert the slender knob-headed stick which was the snake in the game between the runner's legs and trip in but rabunta was too skilful a runner to be stopped by trifles he simply kicked the snake out of his way and hurried on to the long house of the chief now this indian settlement into which the runner had come was the powhatan village of wirawokoboko and was the one in which the old chief wabunsonakuk usually resided here was the long council house in which the chieftains of the various tribes in the confederacy met for counsel and for action and here too was the long tenement house in which the old chief and his immediate family lived it was into this dwelling that the runner dashed 
in a group about the central fire pit he saw the chief even before he could himself stop his headlong speed however his race with news came to an unexpected end the five fires were all surrounded by lolling indians for the weather in the winter of sixteen o seven was terribly cold and an indian when inside his house always likes to get as near to the fire as possible but down the long passageway the children were noisily playing at their games at guskahe or peach pits at guska esata or deer buttons and some of the younger boys were turning wonderful somersaults up and down the open spaces between the fire pits just as the runner rabunta sped by the passageway one of these youthful gymnasts with a dizzy succession of handsprings came whizzing down the passageway right in the path of rabunta there was a sudden collision the tumbler's stout little feet came plump against the breast of rabunta and so sudden and unexpected was the shock that both recoiled and runner and gymnast alike tumbled over in a writhing heap upon the very edge of one of the big bonfires then there was a great shout of laughter for the indians dearly loved a joke and such a rough piece of unintentional pleasantry was especially relished wa wa rabunta they shouted pointing at the discomfited runner as he picked himself out of the fire knocked over by a girl and the deep voice of the old chief said half sternly half tenderly my daughter you have well nigh killed our brother rabunta with your foolery that is scarce girl's play why will you be such a pocahontas algonquin for little tomboy the runner joined in the laughter against him quite as merrily as did the rest and made a dash at the little ten-year-old tumbler which she nimbly evaded mama no toic, he said the feet of mataoka are even heavier than the snake of nuntakuas her brother i have but escaped them both with my life mama no toic, i have news for you the braves with the brother of ope chancano have taken the pale-faced chief in the chickahominy swamp and are bringing him to the council house wa said the chief it is well we will be ready for him at once robin ta was surrounded and plied with questions the earlier american indians were always a very inquisitive folk and were great gossips robin ta's news would furnish fire-pit talk for months so they must know all the particulars what was this white man kakurus like what had he on did he use his magic against the braves were any of them killed for the fame of the white kakurus the great captain as the indians called the courageous and intrepid little governor of the virginia colony captain john smith had already gone through the confederacy and his capture was even better than a victory over the deadliest enemies the monahoaks robin ta was as good a gossip and story-teller as any of his tribesmen and as he squatted before the upper fire-pit and ate a hearty meal of parched corn which the little mataoka brought him as a peace-offering he gave the details of the celebrated capture the great captain he said and two of his men had been surprised at the chickahominy swamps by the chief opechancano and two hundred braves the two men were killed by the chief but the captain seeing himself thus entrapped seized his indian guide and fastened him before as a shield and thus sent out so much of his magic thunder from his fire-tube that he killed or wounded many of the indians and yet kept himself from harm though his clothes were torn with arrow-shots at last however said the runner the captain had slipped into a mud-hole in the swamp and being there surrounded was dragged out and made captive and he robin ta had been sent on to tell the great news to the chief the indians especially admired bravery and cunning this device of the white chieftain and his valor when attacked appealed to their admiration and there was great desire to see him when the next day he was brought into the village by the chief of the pamunki or york river people ope chancono brother of the chief of the pohatans 
the renowned prisoner was received with the customary chorus of indian yells and then acting upon the one leading indian custom the law of unlimited hospitality a bountiful feast was set before the captive who like the valiant man he was ate heartily though ignorant what his fate might be the indians seldom wantonly killed their captives when a sufficient number had been sacrificed to avenge the memory of such braves as had fallen in the fight the remaining captives were either adopted as tribesmen or disposed of as slaves so valiant a warrior as this pale-faced cockerus was too important a personage to be used as a slave and wabunsonacook the chief received him as an honored guest rather than as a prisoner kept him in his own house for two days and adopting him as his own son promised him a large gift of land then with many expressions of friendship he returned him well escorted by indian guides to the trail that led back direct to the english colony at jamestown this rather destroys the long familiar romance of the doughty captain's life being saved by the king's own daughter but it seems to be the only true version of the story based upon his own original report but though the oft-described rescue did not take place the valiant englishman's attention was speedily drawn to the agile little indian girl mataoka whom her father called his tomboy or pocahontas she was as inquisitive as any young girl savage or civilized and she was so full of kindly attentions to the captain and bestowed on him so many smiles and looks of wondering curiosity that smith made much of her in return gave her some trifling presents and asked her name now it was one of the many singular customs of the american indians never to tell their own names nor even to allow them to be spoken to strangers by any of their own immediate kindred the reason for this lay in the superstition which held that the speaking of one's real name gave to the stranger to whom it was spoken a magical and harmful influence over such person for the indian religion was full of what is called the supernatural so when the old chief of the pohatans who for this very reason was known to the colonists by the name of his tribe pohatan rather than by his real name wabunsonakuk was asked his little girl's name he hesitated and then gave in reply the nickname by which he often called her pocahontas the little tomboy for this agile young maiden by reason of her relationship to the head chief was allowed much more freedom and fun than is usually the lot of indian girls who were as a rule the patient and uncomplaining little drudges of every indian home and village so when captain smith left werowokomoko he left one firm friend behind him the pretty little indian girl mataoka who long remembered the white man in his presence and determined after her own wilful fashion to go into the white man's village and see all their wonders for herself in less than a year she saw the captain again for when in the fall of sixteen o eight he came to her father's village to invite the old chief to jamestown to be crowned by the english as king of the pohatans this bright little girl of twelve gathered together the other little girls of the village and almost upon the very spot where many years after cornwallis was to surrender the armies of england to the rebel republic she with her companions entertained the english captain with a gay indian dance full of noise and frolic soon after this second interview mataoka's wish to see the white man's village was gratified for in that same autumn of sixteen o eight she came with rabunta to jamestown she sought out the captain who was then president of the colony and entreated the liberty of certain of her tribesmen who had been detained in other words treacherously made prisoners by the settlers because of some fear of an indian plot against them smith was a shrewd enough man to know when to bluster and when to be friendly he released the indian captives to mataoka's wish 
well knowing that the little girl had been duly coached by her wily old father but feeling that even the friendship of a child may often be of value to a people in a strange land the result of this visit to jamestown was the frequent presence in the town of the chieftain's daughter she would come sometimes with her brother nantaquaus sometimes with the runner rabunta and sometimes with certain of her girl followers for even little indian girls had their dearest friends quite as much as have our own clannish young schoolgirls of to-day i am afraid however that this twelve-year-old mataoka fully deserved even when she should have been on her good behavior among the white people the nickname of little tomboy that her father had given her for we have the assurance of sedate master william strachey secretary of the colony that the before remembered pocahontas powhatan's daughter sometimes resorting to our fort of the age then of eleven or twelve years did get the boys forth with her into the market-place and make them wheel falling on their hand turning their heels upward whom she would follow and wheel so herself all the fort over from which it would appear that she could easily stunt the english boys at making cartwheels but there came a time very soon when she came into jamestown for other purposes than turning somersaults the indians soon learned to distrust the white men because of the unfriendly and selfish dealings of the newcomers their tyranny their haughty disregard of the indians wishes and desires and their impudent meddling alike with chieftains and with tribesmen discontent grew into hatred and led on by certain traitors in the colony a plot was arranged for the murder of captain smith and the destruction of the colony three times they attempted to entrap and destroy the great captain and his people but each time the little mataoka full of friendship and pity for her new acquaintance stole cautiously into the town or found some means of misleading the conspirators and thus warned her white friends of their danger one dark winter night in january sixteen o nine captain smith who had come to werowokomoko for a conference and treaty with wabun sonakuk whom he always called powhatan sat in the york river woods awaiting some provisions that the chief had promised him for edibles were scarce that winter in the virginia colony there was a light step beneath which the dry twigs on the ground crackled slightly and the wary captain grasped his matchlock and bade his men be on their guard again the twigs crackled and now there came from the shadow of the woods not a train of indians but one little girl mataoka or pocahontas be guarded my father she said as smith drew her to his side the corn and the good cheer will come as promised but even now my father the chief of the pohatans is gathering all his power to fall upon you and kill you if you would live get you away at once the captain prepared to act upon her advice without delay but he felt so grateful at this latest and most hazardous proof of the little girl's regard that he desired to manifest his thankfulness by presence the surest way to reach an indian's heart my daughter he said kindly you have again saved my life coming alone and at the risk of your own life through the irksome woods and in this gloomy night to admonish me take this i pray you from me and let it always tell you of the love of captain smith and the grateful pioneer handed her his much prized pocket compass an instrument regarded with awe by the indians and esteemed as one of the instruments of the white man's magic but mataoka although she longed to possess this wonderful path-teller shook her head not so kakorus she said if it should be seen by the tribesmen or even by my father the chief i should but be as dead to them for they would know that i have warned you whom they have sworn to kill and so would they kill me also stay not to parley my father but be gone at once and with that says the record 
she ran away by herself as she came so the captain hurried back to jamestown and mataoka returned to her people soon after smith left the colony sick and worn out by the continual worries and disputes with his fellow colonists and mataoka felt that in the absence of her best friend in the increasing troubles between her tribesmen and the pale-faces it would be unwise for her to visit jamestown her fears seem to have been well grounded for in the spring of sixteen thirteen mataoka being then about sixteen was treacherously and by stratagem kidnapped by the bold and unscrupulous captain argall half pirate half traitor and was held by the colonists as hostage for the friendship of the poetan within these three years however she had been married to the chief of one of the tributary tribes koko um by name but as was the indian marriage custom koko um had come to live among the kindred of his wife and had shortly after been killed in one of the numerous indian fights it was during the captivity of the young widow at jamestown that she became acquainted with master john rolfe an industrious young englishman the man who first of all the american colonists attempted the cultivation of tobacco master rolfe was a widower and an ardent desirer of the conversion of the pagan savages he became interested in the young indian widow and though he protests that he married her for the purpose of converting her to christianity and rather ungallantly calls her an unbelieving creature it is just possible that if she had not been a pretty and altogether captivating young unbeliever he would have found less personal means for her conversion well the englishman and the indian girl as we all know were married lived happily together and finally departed for england here all too soon in sixteen seventeen when she was about twenty-one the daughter of the great chieftain of the Pohatans died her story is both a pleasant and a sad one it needs none of the additional romance that has been thrown about it to render it more interesting an indian girl free as her native forests made friends with the race that all unnecessarily became hostile to her own brighter perhaps than most of the girls of her tribe she recognized and desired to avail herself of the refinements of civilization and so gave up her barbaric surroundings cast in her lot with the white race and sought to make peace and friendship between neighbors take the place of quarrel and war the white race has nothing to be proud of in its conquest of the people who once owned and occupied the vast area of the north american continent the story is neither an agreeable nor a chivalrous one but out of the gloom which surrounds it there come some figures that relieve the darkness the treachery and the crime that make it so sad and not the least impressive of these is this bright and gentle little daughter of wabun sonakuk chief of the pohatans mataoka friend of the white strangers whom we of this later day know by the nickname her loving old father gave her pocahontas the algonquin end of section fourteen end of historic girls by eldridge streeter brooks